meeting of October 24th to order. I appreciate everybody coming down and if, if everybody could, could take a seat and uh, we'll get through the, the agenda. And so our first order of business is the adoption of the agenda, but we've had a, a couple, I wanna say a couple of things about the agenda. First of all, on the agenda, uh, Commissioner Ro Elam is here on behalf of the mayor, and so I want to make that official. And uh, the letter was sent to the director, and so I appreciate uh, Commissioner Elam being here, and we'll make sure that this agenda has uh, Commissioner Elam on it. Um, and then also, on item 15, there's a lot of interest and in a lot of folks uh, that are here to testify. And so I would ask uh, the commission to consider putting that as the first item to hear, the first regular item to hear for a public hearing. Um, and that because we're close to potentially losing a quorum. And so uh, I wanna add that to the motion of adopting the agenda is that we move that item 15 up to being the first item heard uh, after we consider the deferral and consent agendas. So that would be part of approving the agenda. Without objection, is there a motion to adopt the agenda with so those moved. changes? Second. There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no, ayes have it. And the agenda is adopted with those changes. Also, uh, now we're on to the approval of the October 10th, 2019 minutes, item C. Uh, and those were mailed out to you prior to this meeting. And commissioners, are there any edits, additions, we'll need a motion to approve those minutes. There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the minutes have been adopted, and now we're on to the recognition of the council members, and uh, we do have a lot of new council members, and so the way that we recognize the council members is you can speak now, or you can speak uh, also, or and or, uh, during your item, and so we do it on a uh, first come, first serve basis when we see you all come in. And so uh, we first saw uh, Councilman Rutherford. Do you want to come on up now or welcome Councilman? And uh, we appreciate your service to the city. And is there a microphone right there? I think we might have to turn that on. Yeah, hold on, let's get you some help. Make sure we, welcome. How's that? All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, members of the commission. Can you hear me okay? Everything's good? A little higher? A little higher? Oh, there we go, okay. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to be here today before you, and I uh, just wanted to say a few words on behalf of the, uh, uh, the item about the property on uh, uh, Nolansville Pike uh, 6210. Um, this is a, basically a situation where we're looking for a resolution that will cause no harm is the best way I know to put it. Um, we have an existing property that's been used in its current form for more than three decades and we're basically looking for it to be able to stay that way. Um, with, with, without that, it's going to cause a significant hardship for Ms. Claude who lives there and uh, I ask your consideration based upon the facts of the case um, and, and the best remedy possible that will cause no harm to her. So I thank you for your, for your time and for your service to Metro. Thank you, sir, and that's item 14, everyone, just so you know. Yes, thank that's you. correct. Thank you, Councilman, appreciate it. All right, and now we've got Council Lady Roberts, I saw. Where's she at? There's Council Lady. Welcome, council member. You're back again. Back again. Congratulations. It's on. Yeah, just pick it up. If you want. So um, again, appreciate what all you do. Congratulations, Council Lady Murphy. 
We have had a lot of discussion about this. There is still a lot of discussion to have, I think. The family is here today to talk to you about um, actually asking for a subdivision to have four houses. Um, there are situations where I'm sure that's applicable. I think today that is probably not something that my neighborhood can support. My neighborhood is willing to acquiesce and give them three instead of four, but they are saying that they want to come and ask you all for four. So because it's my job to represent my neighborhood and to uh, my constituents are the voice I have to say I am opposed to this today and I have to say that there's no exceptions because the reason we are trying to put a moratorium on building is the density is overwhelming as it is in a lot of neighborhoods but the nations what happened there is now happened in Charlotte Park and so we have a situation where my neighbors are saying let people build what they can build by right and that's in this situation where I, I'm asking you to do is let them build what they can build by right so thank you thank you council and that's item number nine we appreciate you coming down and we now have councilman Brandon Taylor where is the councilman at where do you go Is Councilman Brandon Taylor, where did he go? Is he here? Councilman Sludge, is he in here? Yeah. Welcome, Councilman. You're back again. I know, right? Thank you, board members. Um, so there are three items on the agenda in District 17 uh, this evening. The first one is item number two. Um, that is the Wedgwood Houston Chestnut Hill study plan. Um, I wanted to give a special thanks to the planning staff, especially Greg and Stephanie for their uh, community engagement over the last, I think it's now almost been three years um, that we've worked on this study plan. This was part of a National Endowment for the Arts grant. Um, it's an Our Town grant talking specifically about uh, these two neighborhoods and how commercial use and residential use and the threats of gentrification and kind of all sort of a microcosm of where we are in the city, um, what could be done to sort of be proactive about those issues. Um, so if you haven't listened to the We Home podcast that was created where residents were speaking with each other that came out of this uh, this effort out of this grant and then the culmination from a planning document or at least this first step um, is a study plan um, I, I want to really thank all the residents who came out and participated in this and particularly uh, residents from Chestnut Hill um, from Chestnut Hill Neighborhood Association and Trimble Action Group um, for those of you who aren't familiar this is a long-standing neighborhood group that was formed around the same time as the Wedgwood Houston neighborhood group which is South Nashville action people um, but there were several people who were kind of through this process and through some other processes were able to help reform tag and kind of get it back into a spot where um, it is very active, meeting regularly. And um, at our last meeting, I think it was very notable that there were more Chestnut Hill residents uh, weighing in than there were Wedgwood Houston. Um, so it shows, quite frankly, the power of studies like this to be able to uh, help a community or help a neighborhood rally around an issue, talk about issues that may or may not be in the plan, but continue that conversation outside the process. Um, so special thanks to Daryl and Brian and Terry and Allison who are on the board, um, who have helped uh, really reinvigorate that community group. Um, I'd, ask for, I'd ask for your approval on that. Um, item number 12 is uh, a series of rezonings um, on Linwood Avenue to OR20. Um, this is a, a funky little spot between the interstate and 8th Avenue South. Um, a couple of parcels have gone to OR20 over here and it matches the policy. Um, this is a request to do a few more. The, uh, the applicant, I asked to go kind of door to door on that block, see who was interested or not. Um, he's done all that work, updated me just a few minutes ago as to where people are. Um, and I feel, I feel good with this application. I think staff recommends approval and I, I feel fine with it as well. Um, the last one I think is on your agenda is number 15, but I think is moving to number one um, in the order. That's the mandatory referral regarding uh, the Rose Park Middle and the Belmont facility. Um, you're gonna hear a lot um, about discussion on this from past and present. Um, I, best I can tell you on a mandatory referral, um, there's uh, staff notes that talk about, okay, what are the uses that are appropriate on a school site um, that may not be directly, you know, textbooks or uh, classroom education. Uh, I think that this facility, and you will hear undoubtedly kind of the where we got to this point kind of how this site is here versus previous sites how it impacts relationships with parks 
All that to say there, I think, are enough ties with this facility that the staff recommends approval. I think that approval is appropriate as well. A reminder that there is a, a lot tied into this that this board may or may not consider today. Um, and that's something that I think uh, Parks Board has to consider next week or in a couple weeks and that the council has to consider. Um, so as far as your mandate, thinking about that from the staff report, thinking about how does this tie into the educational mission of this parcel, of this property, of the school, um, I would point to the fact that uh, I just saw today, I think y'all may have seen today as well, that the principals of the schools on either side of this parcel have written in support. Um, I have to rely on educational professionals on things like that, so quite frankly, it made me feel a little bit better to see that those letters were in there. Um, and I would ask for your approval. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I appreciate you coming down. Always a pleasure to see you, sir. Thank you. And we'll make, see if uh, Councilman Brandon Taylor, is he? He's gone, okay. That's not a problem. All right, I wanna just make sure we, we get every council member. And so um, the councilman, uh, Councilman Taylor, has asked that item 11 and item 13 be deferred one meeting. And so generally the commission has been uh, a very accommodating in the councilman's request because they have to carry the legislation. And so I know Council A. Murphy knows that we try to do that uh, because they do have to pull uh, they have to carry the legislation. So I would, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask that that be put on the deferral list, but we- Oh, there he is. We'll vote. Oh, there's the councilman. Councilman, come on up. Welcome, and uh, come on in the middle here, and then there's a microphone that you have to pick up. We, congratulations, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, so f I have a few things on the agenda today. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so 4A and 4B, we're, we're deferring. Uh, we're having conversations with the applicant now. Uh, we're having conversations with the applicant now um, to have uh, um, some more time with the community and, uh, and negotiate some items that they're looking for. And then 11 and 13, I just had a, ha had a chance to speak with the applicant now and um, want to keep that on the consent agenda for today, yes. You want to keep it on the consent agenda? Yes, please. Okay, so I take back what I said, <laughs> and we appreciate you coming down, and uh, con like I said, congratulations. I'm sure we'll see you around a lot more. So yes, thank you often, very often. Yes, very often, hopefully not too often. often. <laughs> I'm just joking. All right, I saw, oh, Council Lady Van Rees, I saw you pop in. Do you want to speak now or? No, I'll wait. Uh, OK, I just want to make sure. Am I missing any other council members? I want to make sure we get to everybody. I do see a former councilman in the room, my good friend, uh, Councilman Ludy Wallace. Welcome, my friend. It's good to see you, sir. Good to see you. We serve together, so I always try to say hi. <laughs> we're we're, we're has-beens, if you, you sort of say. I'm, I'm out of order. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so no other council members. Uh, we are on count. We are on item E, which is items for deferral. Lisa. The following items are included for deferral or withdrawal. Item number one, 2019 CP 005002 on page four of your agenda, the East Nashville Community Plan Amendment Dickerson South Corridor Study. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 14th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 4A, 2019 CP 008003, the North Nashville Community Plan Amendment on page five of your agenda. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. The associated case, item 4B, 2019 Z 135 PR 001. It's a request to rezone along Buchanan. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number five, 2019 Z015TX001. Uh, staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral, and just to make sure, it's items one, 4A, 4B, and five. Is that correct? That's correct. Commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral. Is there a motion? 
There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items are deferred. And now we are on the consent agenda. Lisa. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. As noticed to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item number six, 2019-Z016TX001 on page five of your agenda, a request for an ordinance to amend Title 17 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws regarding the waiting period for revocation of a short-term rental permit. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number seven, 2019-Z017TX001, it's a request for an ordinance to amend section 1716-250 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws regarding the existence of a short-term rental property owner-occupied in two family zoning districts. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number eight, 2019-Z018-TX001 on page six of your agenda. It's a request for an ordinance amending Metropolitan Code chapters 5.2 and 17.4, authorizing the Metro government to come under the provisions of TCA section 675-218 and establishing a historic property review board empowered to abate property taxes relating to certain improvements or restorations made to historic properties. Staff recommendation is to approve the amendments to Title 17. Item number 11, 2019-Z-152-PR-001. It's a request to rezone from RS-5 to R-6A for property located at 1544 12th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve, and I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 12, 2019-Z-154-PR-001. A request to rezone from R6 to OR20A for properties located on Linwood Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 13, 2019-Z-155-PR-001 on page 7 of your agenda. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for property located at 1518 16th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve, and I will note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 14, 2019-Z-156-PR-001. It's a request to rezone from AR2A to MULA for property located on Nolansville Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. And item number 19, under other business, to accept the director's report and approve administrative items. Thank you, Lisa. So, commissioners, the items on the consent agenda are a little different, so we need to make sure we get these right. So items number six, seven, eight, 11, 12, 13, 14, and <coughs> 19. Is that correct? All right, so commissioners, you've heard those items that are on the consent agenda. Is there a motion to adopt? Move approval. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items are adopted, which means that we will hear these items in this order. I, as we discussed, uh, items 15, 2, 3A, 3B, 9, and 10. And so we'll hear the, those items for public hearing. Any questions? Everybody's good? All right, so we're ready for item 15. Item number 15 is the review of a mandatory referral for Rose Park Middle School for a Belmont University lease agreement. It's a request to, to approve Amendment 3 to the ground lease between 
Metro and Park, Metro Parks and Belmont, and to approve a new ground lease between Metro, the Board of Education, and Belmont. Staff recommendation is to approve. Uh, just to orient you a bit, um, there are three pieces of property that kind of make up this one campus. In the middle, the largest is the E.S. Rose Park. And then on either side is Carter Lawrence Middle School and Rose Park Middle School. I'm sorry, Carter Lawrence Elementary School. So first of all, because we don't have these frequently, we wanted to go over just a little bit about what is a mandatory referral and why you all are seeing this under review. Um, the Metro Charter 11505 establishes that um, once a community has adopted, once a uh, organization has adopted a general plan, which we have, Nashville Next, then no public buildings, infrastructure, utilities, parks, et cetera, can be uh, constructed or authorized until the Planning Commission has approved those. Further, any changes to existing public infrastructure, such as the widening of a road, abandoning, abandonment of an alley, leasing of land, sale of land, those must also be approved by the Planning Commission. The Charter states that if not acted on within 30 days, a, pr a proposal is deemed approved by the Commission. Our Planning Commission rules and procedures also speak to the role of um, the Planning Commission in regard to mandatory referrals. And essentially, the rules and procedures authorize the Executive Director to act on behalf of the Planning Commission in regards to mandatory referrals. However, if the dir Director finds that a mandatory referral should not be approved, or where he and she decides that consideration by the Commission is warranted, the application may be submitted directly to the Commission for action. That's what this is. Planning review is generally limited to land use policy and conformance with the adopted general plan, which in this case is Nashville Next. There are two separate components to this request. The first is Amendment 3 to the ground lease existing between Metro acting in, as parks and Belmont regarding ES Rose Park. The second com component is a new ground lease between Metro acting on behalf of the Board of Education and Belmont regarding Rose Park Middle School. I'm gonna discuss each one separately. The first component is the ES Rose Park Amendment 3. Amendment 2 to the lease agreement was approved in 2017 for the construction of an athletic facility. Amendment three is to remove this athletic facility from the lease, essentially reverting back to the agreement for ES Rose Park as it existed prior to Amendment two. And so this is essentially reverting back to the existing lease agreement. Component two, and the one that I will spend the most time on, is the Rose Park Middle School lease. This would approve a, an athletic facility at Rose Park Middle School. It's proposed to be an 80 by 120 build, uh, square foot building owned by um, Metro Nashville Public Schools with shared use by the public schools, RBI, and Belmont University. In regards to the lease of Rose Park Middle School, we looked at it from several perspectives. I'm gonna go through each one of these individually. The first is schools as the center for civic life. Historically, as we have moved through the development of cities, schools and their related facilities have served as centers of civic life within communities, serving more than just a, the, an educational use. Uh, one of the planning goals that we have is to ensure that the facilities in this existing cluster of public uses continue to be designed in a way that allows for collaborative spaces that can meet the needs of a diverse set of community members, the diversity of the users of this space. Uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools has determined that the first floor of this facility will meet resource needs of their students. In regards to the land use policies, which is something that we really ground all of our decisions in, and which is what is adopted by Nashville Next, Rose Park Middle School is within a civic policy. The primary intent of civic policy is to preserve and enhance existing publicly owned properties that are used for civic purposes. Community education and its associated facilities are appropriate within this policy area. The Metro Nashville Public School has determined that this facility, the proposed facility, meets the threshold for an educational use by being available to their students. This is just to give you an overview of the policy of the area. 
In the middle, you have the larger piece of property, which is ES Rose Park. On either side, Carter Lawrence, Rose Park Middle School. Those are within civic policies. ES Rose Park is with an open space policy. Our focus is on this piece of property, which is in, within the civic policy. The third thing that we looked at in consideration is, the, is future expansion for the school. Uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools has determined that the construction of this facility in this location will not preclude future expansion or redevelopment of the school site. From a long-term planning perspective, which would be what we are looking at, the proposal is generally consistent with planning standards for capital project planning. Given these factors, staff recommendation is to approve. Thank you, appreciate that. And so a lot of times we don't consider these items. Um, and so I also wanna make sure that we're crystal clear on our role. And so I'm gonna ask our attorney what the Planning Commission's role is so that we're completely clear on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I understand that there's been a number of comments submitted. Uh, you're gonna hear even more testimony live here today from a number of people throughout the community. And so um, I just wanna make sure that when uh, receiving or considering the, the comments, we're, we're viewing them in the appropriate light. Um, as Ms. Milligan stated, the mandatory referrals come to the commission uh, based upon two sections. One is TCA Code Provision 13.4.104. The other is Metropolitan Charter Section 11.505. And so what both of those state, uh, sections state, uh, amongst other things, is that no public building or structure um, shall be constructed when there's a general plan until and unless the Planning Commission approves the location and extent thereof. And so when examining um, this proposal, I think it's important to consider um, the long-term planning goals for the school and for this, this area specifically and how this um, facility um, uh, might conflict with that, if at all. Uh, so for example, if there was a proposed expansion of the school within the term of the lease, the, the com commission might say, well, would this facility somehow um, make that expansion more difficult? Um, but it's important that the commission are ma is making its decision based upon planning and land use principles. Um, I don't think the, the planning commission's role in this decision is to um, question the, the wisdom of any specific lease term. Rather, I think you would be looking at the wisdom of the lease in totality as it relates to the planning principles, a number of which have been um, enumerated by the Planning Commission staff. Um, if you determine that the location or extent thereof um, conflicts with these planning principles or maybe the long-term goals of this specific site, then at that point you would want to cite specific facts on the record to uh, justify why you think it, it might conflict with those long-term planning goals. And if you guys have any questions, obviously I'll be here to answer those. Yeah, and then uh, I'm gonna hand it over to the director uh, to tell us you know, the process of where this goes after we hear it, where does it go, and what's that process, so Director Kim. Thank you, forgive my laryngitis tonight. Hopefully we'll, voice will keep up. Um, so essentially the planning department is providing a recommendation to you which you'll entertain, and then that is advisory to Metro Council. So Metro Council ultimately will hear this uh, for three readings at Council. And so we are in an, in an advisory role. Unlike zone changes where an approval or a disapproval can affect the vote counts at Council, that is not the case here. And so um, 
Anything Thank you. else from staff? Then? I just wanted to make sure before we started the public hearing that everyone was clear on a, the, the process uh, and, and what our role was as the planning commission. I think that's very helpful from, from our sta staff attorney. So Metro attorney, I appreciate that. Um, Vice chair, anything else th and before we start the public hearing? All right, and so here, I, I know there's some folks that, um, uh, are new coming to the planning commission and so the, I, I like to always say the process and uh, you know, we do this every every couple weeks, and so we know the process. But just so everybody knows, um, the applicant will have 10 minutes, uh, and then after that, and they can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal uh, if they choose to do that. And then um, everyone that supports it will speak for two minutes. And then if it's a community organization or a neighborhood association, uh, we allow five minutes. But there's a lot of people here to speak, so I, I ask everybody try not to repeat yourself. Be very professional. Always address the chair. Uh, we appreciate everybody coming down. Um, and I can't say enough thank you uh, for caring about your community and thank you for, for giving us your insight. And so we appreciate that very much. We're all volunteers on this commission. Uh, and then the um, op opponents will speak for two minutes. Uh, and then the rebuttal. And then if the council member wants to speak, we always do that. And then we will close the public hearing and go into deliberation. So I declare the public hearing open and the applicant will have 10 minutes. You can save two of the 10 for rebuttal. Welcome, please state your name. Oh, and everybody needs to state your name and address when you speak for the record, uh, appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you. Jennifer Bell, 1806 10th Avenue North. Um, I would like to request two minute rebuttal. My name is Jennifer Bell and I serve as the Director of, of uh, Extended Learning Programs for Metro Schools. Extended Learning Programs is a division of student services and is responsible for the direct and indirect support of all before school, after school, and summer programs across our district. Additionally, we're responsible for the oversight and facilitation of the after school supper program and the summer meal program. Today I'm speaking to you as both the Director of Extended Learning Programs as well as a resident of Davidson County and a former coach within Metro Schools. Understand the important role that athletics play in the role of youth. Youth recreation sports in the Nashville area have seen a decline in the last decade. Facilities such as Music City, Una Park, and other Metro Parks have been repurposed, closed, or consolidated. For many of our Metro School students, their first exposure to athletics is when they join a school team. Students who join athletics programs such as baseball and softball are usually not accessible to those students until they reach the ninth grade. At that time, they now lack access to programs at a young age, as well as lack the prerequisite skills to excel in competitive sports. For many students, competitive sports pave a way for future success. Speaking as a former seven-year coach here in Metro Schools, I know firsthand what it's like to lack adequate facilities and equipment. Too often we rely on worn out uniforms, donated equipment, and borrowed facilities. I know firsthand what it's like to have no field, no training facilities, or inadequate facilities that call on volunteers to build dugouts or even bleachers for players. As compared to our neighboring counties, such as Williamson and Wilson, our Metro school students do not have equity of access to facilities to engage in sports programs. I ask why our youth should not be afforded an opportunity to practice and develop their talents in such a top-notch facility. For many, it's the only exposure they'll have to such a facility. Athletics and after-school pro programs play an intricate role in student success. These programs foster positive mentorship, build confidence, promote teamwork, and afford students an opportunity to engage in a program of interest. In a city in which crime rates peak during the hours of 3 p.m. and 8 p.m., it's critical that we seek to expand opportunities for students to engage in positive experiences as opposed to negative and or unsafe influences in the communities in which they live. Like many of our students, my opportunity to attend college was made pay possible because of athletics. It was because of the constant mentorship I received from coaches and the scholarships that I received as an athlete that I can say I'm a first-generation college graduate. 
As the director of extended learning, I am charged with providing equity of access to high quality out of school time experiences for youth. As the percentage of two parent working homes and traffic increases, so does the demand for out of school time programs. Restricted by funding, we constantly seek to develop community partnerships such as this in an effort to expand out of school time programs to reach more students. These pro programs have a, pro a proven impact on student success. I would like to share with you all some national as well as um, local data to prove the impact of youth engagement in out of school time on student success. As indicated below, out of school time impacts four key performance indicators for Metro schools. Those key performance indicators uh, respond to literacy, math, attendance, and suspension rates. On a national and state level, 50% of students who attend an after school program regularly improved in both language arts and math proficiency. State evaluation of 21st century, a, fundal, a federal funder for after school learning, found that programs, um, that these programs have a positive impact on students' school day attendance. According to the After School Alliance, 60% of students who attend an after school program regularly improved behaviors in class. But that's on a national level. Let's talk about what's happening directly here in our metro schools. S attendance rates among those students who participated 30 days or more last year have higher attendance rates as compared to the school-wide and the district. On average, the course grades among those students in literacy and math not only exceeded the state goal, but also exceed the school-wide and district-wide course averages. OSS out-of-school suspensions among students who participated in out-of-school time made up only 2% of the overall suspensions in those schools. At the past zoning appeal regarding this matter, it was argued that these batting facilities did not meet the definition of community education, but I beg to differ. In review of the Nashville.gov community education website, a robust list of community education pro programs are offered. Just this last fall, there were 19 programs that were offered that were related to wellness initiatives. These wellness initiatives included anything from badminton or yoga. So if our city defines wellness as community education, why would we dispute that wellness is not part of this community education? This project includes more components than the batting facilities, components in which I'm directly responsible for. The Easley Community Center currently serves approximately 100 students in their after school program, which is below their capacity. We seek to grow that capacity to over 300, drawing on students in neighboring schools. Every student will receive a supper and academic support led by certified teachers, community volunteers, and aspiring educators. Finally, students will have the opportunity to engage in activities of interest. These in, this includes recreation sports, such as baseball and softball, as well as activities such as robotics and music. This batting cage will not only be used by Belmont sports leagues or high school sports leagues, but younger students who deserve an opportunity to grow their talent. October 24th today is Lights On After School, a national day of celebration and advocacy for out-of-school time programs. And whereas we're celebrating the impact of out-of-school time, both nationally and locally, I ironically find myself here advocating for youth to express my commitment to ensure that this facility offers equitable access to our Metro school students. In addition to that, I'd like to take a moment to read a letter for you all from uh, Mr. Rami Vassar, who's the principal of Rose Park um, Middle School. He could not be here, it's their homecoming. Um, he reads, I'm a member of a team, a collaboration with Metro Parks, planning a comprehensive enrichment program for the Edge Hill community. As principal of Rose Park Middle, I'm excited about having the facility become a part of our campus and having MMPS teams use this facility along with younger children in the neighborhood and Belmont University. Having the batting facility conveniently located at our site near Easley Center, Carter Lawrence and the athletic complex will help to facilitate success of our plan. Why add sports as a component to the enrichment program? A 2019 Hanover Research Institute report cites the community that grows around a school's athletic program can, ex can experience positive social benefits in the form of overall academic improvement for the student body. You can just imagine what a program that includes sports will do for the Edge Hill community, especially for those Metro school students who are bused every day and thus cannot participate in sports where they attend school. 
These same students often do not have access to email or computers in their homes, and many parents may not be equipped to reinforce academic skills or pay for their kids to do high-priced programs like Kumon and Sylvan Learning. Edge Hill kids and their families need equity. The program that we are proposing helps us make optimal use of the existing sports facility. Adding a batting facility to help kids see how practice can make perfect provides equity, adds an academic component, and helps to close a much needed gap for educational needs of Edge Hill children. Please vote to approve this batting facility to be owned by Metro Schools. Plan for my school, Rose Park Middle. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll give you a minute and 45 seconds for rebuttal. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? And if y'all would come up and kind of line up in the middle and then uh, uh, that would be helpful if you guys could, could start lining up, every, everyone. And state your name and address. Yes. And uh, good afternoon, I'm here on behalf of Belmont University and request five minutes uh, representing an organization. Which organization? Belmont University. Oh, sorry, thank you. I didn't hear that part. I must Joyce Cersei and I, I got wax that. in my ears. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Rogers. I serve as Vice President for Administration and University Council at Belmont. I'd also like to state uh, that Doug Sloan is here uh, working with Mel Belmont and Metro Public Schools. Allow me to briefly describe what brought us to this point today. You've already heard about the 2017 amendment that is proposed to be withdrawn here. But needless to say, after that amendment was approved, uh, in May of 2017 for the site on the north side of the park. Uh, some members of the community expressed some concern about the impact of that on the proximity of properties on Archer Street as well as uh, the view from that side of the park. And in response, Belmont voluntarily suspended its efforts to begin construction so that there could be adequate time to hear concerns and improve the batting facility concept. Over the next 17 months, three community meetings and at least six working group meetings with representatives all of all concerned parties ensued. As a result, the site of the batting facility moved to the south side of the park adjacent to the Easley Community Center and included plans for an extended learning site. The Metro Parks Board approved the new location in September of 2018, but just before going to the Metro Council, Metro Schools contacted Belmont and asked that the facility be located on Rose Park Middle School property so that student athletes and after school programs participants could use it. The school site makes use of a previously unused portion of the school property located on a steep embankment. Late last year, the Board of Public Education approved an agreement authorizing Belmont to construct the facility. Belmont's financial commitment includes funding the $6 million cost of the new building to be owned by MNPS, making an annual grant of $35,000 to support the after-school programming, programming and Saturday operating hours at the Easley Center, and at MNPS's request, providing a staff person to operate the batting facility. In reliance on the agreement, as approved by the school board, grading and foundation permits were issued by Metro, and construction activities began this past June. Belmont has now expended approximately a million dollars for grading and foundation work, and in late August, the Metro Legal Department informed MNPS that the agreement for the use of the embankment for the construction of the batting facility would need to receive approval of the Metro Council. Thus, we're here today. It would be hard to overstate the long-standing nature and high quality of the relationship between Belmont and MNPS, which in recent years includes not only the scholarships to MNPS students as part of the Rose Park Lease Agreement, but also the $23 million that Belmont has invested in the Bridges to Belmont program, scholars set aside for graduates of high-need MNPS <laughs> high schools. We look forward to continuing this collaboration and support at the Rose Park Middle School site. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I'm Joyce Cersei at 1029 Villa Place at Edge Hill. I'm Director of Belmont's uh, Office of Community Relations, an 18-year resident of Edge Hill, and a former nonprofit CEO, which led programming for over 2,000 residents from infants to seniors in and near four Nashville public housing sites. I'm also a former professor at Fisk, TSU, and Meharry, so I understand community and education well. My office partners with campus departments and make sure we do our mission to equip students to engage and transform the world. That transformation must start in our own neighborhood. We want students to understand that the best ideas and results come when people of diverse backgrounds work together. Toward that end, when we began talking about a batting facility at Metro Parks on Rose Park Athletic Facility, we gathered representatives from Metro Parks, schools, reviving baseball in inner cities, Rose Park Middle and Carter Lawrence Principals, Salama Ministries, Watson Grove, Kane, Greater Bethel, and Belmont Churches, and men who played baseball at Rose Park as boys. Organized neighbors of 
with Edge Hill board members were also there. We discussed how best to use the school's park and batting facility for Edge Hill's children. That's when we discovered Metro Schools desire to start an Edge Hill out of school program. This will be the only Metro out of school program in the city to expressly offer sports sciences. At our next meeting, we covered the walls with goals and did asset mapping. In addition to planning and working meetings, Councilman Sledge and I met with the Edge Hill Residents Association where we got even more great ideas and he regularly updated them. We have two more community meetings scheduled. This free extended learning program will improve grades and raise test scores, expose children to STEM, performing arts, career choices, and sports as an option for physical activity to make them healthy. Our community and Belmont can assist Metro schools in closing the gap for our youth. More information on neighborhood projects and investment of time and resources to impact Edge Hill are in your packet. When organized neighbors of Edge Hill's Reverend Barnes was at his last accountability meeting, he said, I didn't think this would work, and then said, now I'm a believer. Over time, implementing out-of-school instruction that includes sports and complements in-school instruction means success for Nashville, Metro Schools, Belmont, and Edge Hill. Thank you for your service. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Come on up. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Before I start, I'd like to invite the parents, grandparents, and children gathered here today in support of this to please stand so that they can see that you're here even though you're not planning to speak. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. Good afternoon, I'm Dewana Wade and I'm with Salama Urban Ministries, a faith-based youth development organization which has been serving the Edge Hill neighborhood for the last 34 years. We've all seen many changes that have taken place in the neighborhood. In all of that change, it seems often that we think of our youth last, unless there's some crime or problem we seek to attribute to them whether deservedly so or not. We are proud of the work we do at Salama and grateful for other agencies who also serve youth in the neighborhood. We are especially grateful and proud of our partnership with Belmont, whose support has helped our Salama youth consistently increase their reading and literacy scores for the last three years. This is a direct result of the dedication of Dr. Joy Kimmins, a Belmont faculty member, and her students. In all this, with all the services provided by our Salama students, or provided for our Salama students and others, it's still not enough. We still don't have the capacity to serve all the students in the neighborhood. I'm here to speak to what I believe is the, in the best interest of neighborhood youth, that they be given an opportunity to grow, to thrive, succeed, flourish, and be embraced in their neighborhood. I've been honored to participate in collaborative meetings with school personnel, congregations, community members, and other nonprofits to pool our talents and resources to plan for increased, no cost after school programming and services for students who live in Edge Hill. This collaboration is an example of the community coming together to provide an opportunity for education and enrichment that doesn't exist anywhere else in the Metro school system. And Edge Hill will be the beginning of something that can and should be replicated in other areas of the city. This is much more than a batting facility. This is public property that will be developed for public use that will benefit the young people in our community. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Good to see you. Hello, my name is John Holmes, 8012 Cloverland Drive. I'm assistant director for Parks and Recreation. I'm here simply to tell you to support and reinforce the positive partnership that exists currently between Belmont and Metro Parks. Uh, Belmont gave the initial investment that created this outstanding facility. Um, they pay for almost all of the upkeep. They utilize the facility, but they utilize it at a time when the general public doesn't usually have ac need access to it. They use it during the day, during the week. So the prime time, the public is available, it's available to the public, as well as to our uh, school teams. E.S. Rose and Carter Lawrence use it on an almost weekly basis. Um, Hume Fogg Baseball, that's their home location, as well as many other high school, MNPS uh, schools and teams. Uh, all I can say is they are the most outstanding partners that we have, truly. Uh, and I deal with partners in all of the different uh, sports and athletic areas. And whenever necessary, they will make adjustments to their schedule to accommodate the public need. So the, while this is perceived as their home 
for their collegiate sports. It is truly the uh, accessible to everyone in the Edge Hill area, as well as everyone in Davidson County. That's all I had to say. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wallace, welcome. All right. Thank you to the, ch to the Planning Commission, and, and I want to say congratulations to our new planning person from the Met Metro Council. You know, I, I don't really feel like I should be here after I've heard all of the discussion and all the people that have spoken in favor of it. I don't, I don't know why we would have to be here. I think that looked like everybody would be for this. Now, I guess one reason why I'm here is I'm probably the reason why this issue is before you. When I served as a member of the council, I look at this as being one of the things during the time I served that I can be most proud of. When Belmont and the Metropolitan Government did a partnership that caused nearly 10 million to be invested. And I was thinking of the community and the young people that will have the opportunity to go and participate in the programs and develop. Now, everybody's asking themselves, what can we do about the youth crime and the youth violence? We have to give them some alternatives. Now, if there's a young person interested on a softball team, on a baseball team, and they want to be good hitters, if they stay in the batting cage, that's going to increase their chances of being a very good hitter. Now, I have confidence everybody involved is trying to do what's right and what's best. And I hope and I wish that people that might have opposition, I was hoping that maybe we could have been trying to come together for programs and activities that we could have at the facilities. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. My name is Roland Huddlestein. I live in Edge Hill neighborhood. And please forgive the hat. I'm having a flyaway hair day. So it's I came okay. here in opposition because I thought that Belmont's got a lot of money and they're not giving very much to the community. Then I saw here on this page here that they're giving $50,000. Sir, are you, let, let's, let's be clear. Hold on one second. Let's, are you here in opposition or? I've just changed. I'm now in favor. Oh, and I'm continue gonna, please. As oh, long sorry. as I can, I, I, if I can I, hold you to the numbers, I'm in favor no, here. We'll restart you. I'm we'll, reading this paper here, see. All right, let's continue your time. Go okay, ahead. Okay, can I get my time back now? He yes, just interrupted I inter me. Yes, I rudely interrupted. I, it was my fault. We'll st there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. One thing, anybody with a cell phone, would you look up batting cages on that cell phone to see what the picture looks like? Okay, now. So if I can hold you to $50,000 from Belmont for this project, 80% of which goes to Carter, goes to the Easley Center, that switches me to a pro. Because that's $40,000 going to the Easley Center. If I can hold this to you, if you can hold this, I can't figure out how to say that. but. If we can be sure that Easley Center is going to get 40000 a year, I'm in favor of that. Now, I have another thing I want to say is I've heard it's real hard to schedule anybody to use those faci the facilities that there are now because Belmont's got it stacked up all the time. Now, I want Belmont to play fair on the playing field. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, and I apologize for interrupting you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Brenda Morrow. As president of the Resident Association for Edge Hill Apartments, I am a tenant and elected to represent all the families living in the 380 unit of public housing. 
There has been at least four meetings for residents to discuss putting the batting facility in our community. Our association has discussed the facility and feel it would be directly beneficial for our children and grandchildren. While we like green space, we know there's a greater need to have our kids productively occupied after school. While some children's parents are uh, in our gentrified community can get in a, a car and go to Brentwood and for their children to play baseball or soccer, it is more environmentally friendly for us to go across the street to Rose Park Community Center, where there is a, where where it is well kept. It is a well-kept, state-of-the-art sports facility. While some children's parents can pay for kids to be tutored or take the ACT <laughs> prep classes, it is more beneficial and cost-effective for our kids to get academic support from Metro Schools-run programs right in their own neighborhood. It has been, a, I have been a part of the Metro Schools planning team to do an enrichment program in the Edge Hill community. This comprehensive program includes hot meals and, well y'all heard that from Miss Jennifer, didn't you? About the hot meals and the after school programs and all that stuff. Um, I just wanted to say that the neighborhood churches, nonprofit, metro schools, and metro parks, and the Edge Hill Apartments Resident Association, along with the fact that I am also the director of the United Way Family Resource Center in the Edge Hill community, uh, along with president of the Resident Association, we all say that uh, there's a lot of people that are speaking for us. And I need to get away from this paper. but. Um, uh, it's a lot of people speaking for us, and we need to know, for you guys to know that we speak for ourselves. We've had a lot of meetings. We've been involved with this since day one, since people, uh, since they first started this. Hold that up for me, baby. <laughs> since we first started with this. And the fact that if you look at Twitter, and I know that the Edge Hill residents from the Op opposing group have sent out emails and stuff for people to log on and to send you all emails. But the bottom line is, a lot of the residents that are the mostly affected and will be using this don't have emails, don't have computers. So that's why we have monthly meetings. That's why I was out today passing out flyers uh, for the upcoming two community meetings on Saturday. And the one on Tuesday will be at Easley Community Center. But um, we try to keep the residents informed and we have positive, productive meetings where they can come and voice their opinions. And for us, we've been doing this a long time and dealing with this a long time. And we would deeply appreciate it if you guys just go ahead and say we approve this so we can get to the work that's at hand, which is making sure that our little ones uh, are ready for productive adulthood and going to college. Thank you, baby. Thank you. And he Thank did a God. great job holding that microphone. His arm she got tired, I think. <laughs> Thank you all you for coming. Okay. So Hello, my name is Doris Huggins, and I am co-chair for Organized Neighbors of Edge Hill. And we conducted a monthly month, month meeting on July the 16th when we were asked to distribute a letter to candidates for office to oppose the building of batting facility at Rose Park Middle School. At that meeting, those present voted to not distribute a letter. No board member had contacted me prior to our meeting to vote on their behalf since they would not be unable they would be unable to attend our meeting. It was several days later when those attending the July the 16th meeting learned that the letter was sent to candidates running in the general election, even though we had not voted, we had voted not to send any letters. At our next meeting on July the 20th, which I also, con also conducted, the minutes of our previous meeting was approved. Again, there had been no request for a proxy voting. 
Our agenda did not include discussion of submitting an item A appeal to ask that a banning facility not be built at Rose Park School. And we took no vote to submit an appeal to the board of zoning appeal. I thank you sincerely. Doris Huggins. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Yeah. Welcome. Calvin C. Barlow, Jr. I am the pastor of Second Missionary Baptist Church. I've pastored our church for 33 years in the 12th uh, South District. 41 years ago, I moved on 905 Douglas, which is also in that same district. We call it the Wave of Belmont at that time. I speak because I am a parent, and 41 years ago, I lived in that, in that area. There was no facility as this. I've been in business, I'm a writer. At that time, I was on the insurance agents. I was fortunate to have the funds to take my kids outside of the community. My only son today teaches in Birmingham, Alabama. He is the uh, head math teacher. He got in Alabama because he played football for Overton High School. And because having played football, uh, that landed him an uh, opportunity to go to Mao College. Today, he's a head math teacher in Birmingham, Alabama, and he continues a, uh, to uh, 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 as a coach in sport, football, soccer, and basketball. I'm here because I believe the Bible says that we should do unto others as we like others to do unto, do, unto us. And simply say to me, I want the same opportunity that my children had for the ATL children. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Appreciate you coming down. All right, thank you. And my name is Barry Barlow. And I'm, I'm here today. I currently serve as the president of the Parent Advisory Council for Metro Schools, and I'm also the current president of the parent-teacher organization at Rose Park Middle School. And I'm a person that represents parents both at the school and system-wide. So I first want to start off by telling you that as a Rose Park parent, I am in favor of this batting facility. If I, would ha if I would have to say to you, if I were to give Belmont a score, I would have to tell you it would be a most favorable score because they have been an excellent community partner, not only for Rose Park, but for MNPS as well. Inside of Rose Park Middle Magnet School, there's a room that we affectionately call the Belmont Room. We use that room for a lot of different activities. Uh, there are students at times come over and help our students with their literacy uh, issues, and that's just part of what they do. During my tenure of, of being the uh, president and being involved with our parent teacher student organization, I've had the privilege of receiving and being able to utilize what we call the Belmont Grant, which goes up uh, each year for us. We've, when with the school lost its Title I funding, we had an issue with some of our kids then needing to bring their, their lunch. And at the time, they had to just bring cold lunches because we did not have microwaves in the cafeteria. Well, when we received the Belmont grant, as the president at the time, I duly purchased those microwaves so now our students have an opportunity to have a hot lunch if they bring it from home, you know, ready to just heat. Also, we've used the Belmont grant to purchase uh, drones. Uh, Rose Park is, the, I think, the fifth middle school in the nation to be uh, given to be STEAM certified, not just have that magnet and STEAM on the building, but to be actually STEAM certified. We've also been privileged to, to work with uh, a Fish University that came over and ran our science club. That, all of that stuff has been a part of the efforts that Belmont has given us monies to buy the necessary equipment to, to, for the children to be able to use that. Also, I wanna say to you that um, we were also dealing with an issue where we had a number, a few African-American students who, who were dealing with the issue of vitamin D deficiency. And so it was told to us if they were sit outside a little more, that could be improved upon. So Rose Park Middle School is one of the few middle schools in the district that has an outside eating area that is ADA compliant. It's only about two or three of those in the district out of 167 schools in this district. 
And so, again, I say to you that Belmont has been an excellent community partner. They spent more than $13 million dealing with these various facilities. And so I think anybody who is, you know, as we say, talk is cheap, but when you're putting your money where your mouth is, I think you deserve those opportunities. And since these opportunities are not opportunities just for a few, but these opportunities are helping many, I think we should move forward in ensuring that Belmont has an opportunity to not only help itself, but to help the, st the students, the children, the faculties and staff of MNPS. And lastly, I want to say to you that also in keeping with being a good community partner, there's a young lady by the name of Sydney Pritchard. I, I didn't call her and ask if I could use her name, but I'm just going to tell her a story. She's a young lady who matriculated through Rose Park, went on to Hume Fogg Magnet High School, and subsequently on graduating from there, because she had been a student at Rose Park, she received funding from Belmont where she's able to matriculate and become a nurse. Now, if that doesn't say that they're, they're helping, then I don't know what it is. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Come on up. Welcome. My name is Charles Howe. I live at 1009 15th Avenue South, and I'm on the uh, neighborhood advisory board as a result of the Rose Park decision. I was one of the community people put on the board. And as such, um, I have participating, participated fully in the meetings with Belmont in regards to this and other issues involving Belmont's interface with the community. And I can attest to the fact that Belmont endeavors tremendously to be a great partner with the community to uh, find solutions to the concerns that people in the community has and to reach out. We've suggested things like the partnership with the, with the black churches, um, the, the mentorship programs, um, even organizations like Salama. Uh, we tried to work through the issues with the, with the batting cage when it was on the park property and um, then discussed thoroughly the use of the school when the school uh, was interested. Um, I just feel like the, the, the programs that Belmont brings, the things that they do enrich the community and, uh, and are of tremendous benefit to the community. And if this is approved, it will add to the almost 2.4 million in scholarships that that we have received as members of the community that our children have received, that the enrichment program will benefit our kids, and that this is just a win-win program for us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. My name is Elijah Turner. I want to say about baseball because don't take away my baseball field because I love to play baseball. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you, young man. Appreciate it. Thank you for this opportunity to the commission. I am Helen Moore Robinson. I'm a 30-year resident of Ackland Avenue. I am exactly within five houses from Belmont's Law School. So with that being said, I don't have to explain to you the changes I have seen in the neighborhood. I only want to emphasize one thing regarding our its city. Do we want it to be sick or do we want it to be healthy? Our city can only be healthy if we have a healthy built environment. If we don't have a healthy built environment, which includes access, uh, healthy communities. Health is not just the sign of how, what your temperature is, but your mental aptitude also. With the infusion of dollars that 
be from collaborative with Metro MNPS and Belmont University. I feel that we can realize a healthy environment in the Edge Hill neighborhood. Thanks to Belmont and their foresight and the collaboration, going through the time and the neighborhood meetings and things that they have set through and worked with and collaborated with our community, there has been a great improvement in the neighborhood. I, for, my, for one, have seen a decrease in the crime rate in the neighborhood. The focus of that neighborhood has greatly changed. I feel that with the lack of pinpoint, intentional built environment, our neighborhood will not be able to be considered something that will help to assure that Nashville is truly an it community. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Tiffany Ibido, uh, address 4049 Pine Orchard Place. And my children, I have two children that went to Carter Lawrence Elementary from kindergarten to fourth grade, and they now go to Rose Park Middle School. And I think it's a, a fabulous idea for the batting cage to go up in this area. And like someone else mentioned, it's a shame that a community would have to go to another community or even outside the county to take advantage of a facility facility like this. And so I am in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? I want to make sure we get everybody. Anybody else? All right. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? <laughs> well. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. This is a complicated issue. There's positives and negatives. Now, the reason I was opposed when I came up here was because figuring it out per square foot, this thing would cost five cents a square foot per month. A house in Edge Hill, an apartment in Edge Hill, costs 11,000, 11 square thousand square feet, cost 80 cents a square foot. Five cents to 80 cents this is like with $15,000 going to the community center. But here, when I'm reading this paper, and that's why I'm po pro on the other side, it's because I want to hold you to $40,000 going to that community center instead of $15,000, which I originally said. But now let me just point out that reading the numbers now, it's 15.5 cents per square foot opposed to a resident in Edge Hill spending 80 cents per square foot. Thank you for your patience. And sir, just state your name and uh, My name is Roland right. Huddleston. I live at 1101 Edge Hill Avenue, overlooking where this site is. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? I want to give it to somebody. I thought I was going to walk off with it, didn't you? <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I'm uh, John Feldhacker. I'm the pastor at Edge Hill United Methodist Church, and I have been there for five years, and I've seen the um, all of the drama around Belmont annexing the park. I've heard it called a lot of different things. Um, I was a high school, college athlete. I understand and agree with everything that's been said about athletics being important for education, for um, becoming well-rounded, healthy, responsible adults. And I agree with everything that's been said about Belmont University being a fantastic partner in the neighborhood. I'm a huge fan of Belmont. They're, they've done uh, tremendous things for the city and for themselves. Um, the only question that I have to ask is from a land use perspective, the building that's being built, the athletic um, building, is being built um, not necessarily for the benefit of the students, although this was the question that I was, I've was i been rattling with all week. I wasn't going to speak because I, I love and respect people on both sides of this disagreement, but the 
building was being built primarily to benefit Belmont University, not for the educational use of the children. And then the use of the building was added, but still the primary reason it's there is to benefit Belmont. And it will be there for 50 years that from a land use perspective could cause problems um, in the future. And the uh, educational benefits are, are important, but those are also available throughout the park, not necessarily in that building. So the main opposition point I would really is more of a question is the concern about the use of the land when it's on school property as opposed to park property. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak <clears throat> in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, everybody. My name's oh, Joe you got, hold on, Joe, you got you to use you the microphone. Yep, so everybody can hear you. Where's Dro? Uh, he left, I bought him his uniform and he's leaving. He's a little kid, he's on the wrong side, he doesn't know it. So basically what's happened here is in the last four years, I came in, I live um, uh, Well, in hold on, you need to state your name. Yeah, Joe Staller. Oh, I forgot, okay, Joe Staller and I'm, uh, and I have an office at 8th Avenue, uh, 1301 8th Avenue South. So I went up to give some money to the local teams because I saw in the paper that, uh, in the TV, that they're going to uh, go to Belmont, was going to give all these resources to the kids in Edgehill. And I said, wow, they got baseball teams, all this stuff up there, and they rebuilt the fields. I went up there, and they say, there's no, there's no f uh, fields for kids. They wiped them all out. They're all gone. The football's gone. Uh, they closed down the community center. So this is $60,000 a year right now going to the, the inner city, except it doesn't go there. Joe, you need to talk to the... It doesn't, go, it doesn't go to the inner city. It goes into the park fund, right? And, then, and so they're supposed to get back. And Charles Howe just left here. I just talked to him a minute ago, and he says he tried to get a hold of Tommy Lynch, and he would never meet with him. Now, Tommy Lynch hadn't even been there for four years. So there is no... So there's supposed to be in this contract, there's supposed to be a, a committee, an advisory committee, that's supposed to say where this money goes and where these fields go, and it's not, it doesn't happen. This is the original contract. So there's, uh, so the university is also supposed to give all these scholarships, and they do, but not to Ed Schultz's in general. So what we really have here is a fiasco. We have all these kids, so four years ago, I went up there and I said, I am gonna make these, we're gonna get Southside Sports back. They're gone. This is where, this is where the African American community started. They built those forts, there's a thousand of them in the ground right there. And so I said, all right, I'm going to get this started again. It's taken four years. We did it this year, but it's taken a whole lot of people to get this going. I probably had about half a dozen people in my office, probably 25 coaches from the neighborhood. We got 60, 70 kids play. So we got it going, but it was over the objection of just not being able to get to the park. If you look at that park, it's covered with stuff. It's not, there's no free space. So um, Mayor Cooper just came and spoke before the election, and he said Belmont's original batting cage was not a cage, it was a building, and it was deceptive, right? And he says, uh, first thing, you keep your assets for community, and don't let some group, whether it's respect the university and metro government, take your assets. So I would like to see a batting cage. I'm on the board of, of ONE and RBI and the Waverly Belmont football, but what we've got to do is we've got to have representation. We have Charles Howe who says, Tommy Lynch has been gone for four years, Thank and you. he can't get an appointment with the guy. So we need the Neighborhood Advisory Committee to be put in place with people from the neighborhood, speak for the neighborhood, not people that are, you know, for kids, not people, there's a lot of people here. Thank let's you, let everybody get involved. We appreciate you coming down. And here's 300 names of people who signed this. Yeah, if you just hand give it well. to Let's have some coaches up here. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Yeah, you need to. Thank you, Welcome. ladies and gentlemen, up here. Uh, give me the opportunity to speak about this situation. My name is Michael Gordon. I am the founder of Waverly Belmont Bulldogs Association. We have been in this neighborhood over 40 some years. Waverly Belmont has been playing ever since 39 years. And I formerly lived on 1027 Villa Place. I was with the original. I'm not opposed to Belmont or the school board because they do great things, and they've helped us along the way. But at some point, the scheduling, we hadn't been able to, to get down with. So that's my, my, my thing is about. We, we played up at Rose Park back in the day. We had football teams. We had a, a football league. Uh, we spoke about it, 
but somehow it was pushed aside. Everything's about soccer. Well, let me say something about Whaley Belmont. We produce state champions for metro schools. Pearl, Hillsboro, Maplewood, McGavick, Hume Falls, Dixon County. We have played on the soccer field. So we, what we are talking about, we had a football game, but we can't use Rose Park. Guess what, Innsworth let us go way out there to Highway 100 and play on their soccer field. And here we are in the edge here, way to Belmont area. Of course, you can see the area's changing way to Belmont, but it's a good change. We, we're not against that, I have nothing. But the thing is, we're right here. We have to play out of Innsworth, or we may have to go to Cane Ridge. And by the way, at Cane Ridge, they, last year, you heard about Devon Starling come out of our program, seven years old, Mr. Football, first one in Nashville at a Metro Public School, Mr. Football. We produce, and um, my thing is, I talked to Bill Mott, and man said that he, he thought we could get something done. And my problem is, we're not talking to the right people, and we're not getting our point across. Now, what they talking about doing for the school system, that's great, and it's, it's a beneficial thing. But they lack on that part of tutoring kids, because I have a bunch of kids could have been tutored. Yeah. Thank uh, you, sir. We appreciate it. Okay, and I want to say this one more thing. But your time's ran out. I, okay, I understand we, we that. We try to be fair to everybody. I, I know this. One more but, thing, one more thought. One more thing. Okay. As, 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 as you see it, let's be fair about this. Let's be fair about this. Let's go back to the drawing board. Let's, let's talk and give us an opportunity to have some opportunity to play at Belmont. A beautiful place. Great Thank deal. You. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Where's the mic at? Uh, it's right on the podium there. My name is Kwame Leo Lillard. Oh, you gotta, you gotta pick the mic. My there name is go. Kwame Leo Lillard, former Planning Commission employee, five years, former District 2 Council for four years. Grew up next to New Hope Church, Bethel AME Church, walked to Cameron School for six years, walked to Carter Lawrence for four years. I think I may have it backwards. But anyway, I'm here to oppose a land grab. Let me put on my glasses. I oppose this lease because it is deceptive financially irresponsible, and promotes social injustice. There are too many parallels between the Rose Park Belmont land grab issue and what I went through in New York City for Columbia University. Did the same thing in Harlem. Harlem fought it. We are going to fight this. It failed in New York City, and it should fail here, because you on this board should know that this is a land grab. It was a failed attempt in New York City to build a gym for Columbia on Harlem property that black folks owned, as it is here. There has been no other attempt until this particular plan to build another facility, an attempt to ultimately take the entire park for Belmont. If the city has not stopped this attempt, then it will surely create more injustice, like Fort Negley. The relationship between Fort Negley and Edge Hill has a long history, and the future of these two locations will also continue to affect and impact each other. Let's do what is needed to protect the public interest and not the interest of Belmont University.
Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Welcome. Good afternoon, board. My name is Keith Floyd. I am a, uh, an RB, RBI coach that was brought into the uh, uh, baseball program over at uh, Rose Park this past year. And actually, my team, 11, 12 year old, won the championship. From what I hear, this is the first time that baseball has been played in that neighborhood for a number of years. Um, not knowing everything that's, uh, that was going on with this situation when I came into the program, um, my main concern is that um, we should all be for the children. Uh, the baseball program was very successful. I had a chance to speak to some of the children that never played baseball. One of the little girls asked how she liked baseball. She said, actually, I didn't think that I would like it, but I loved it. So one of my passions for years in Nashville is to see baseball in Nashville. Now, I'm a firm believer that everything glitter isn't gold. My main concern is, coming from both sides, that this thing is governed for future, pref for future reasons to make sure that there's never a takeover with what's going on with the Belmont complex. I think the Belmont is doing a great job, but we did have some problems that we ran into this year at the end of the season, not being able to use the field. Um, that, that was my home field. We, we overlook downtown. And it was kind of disheartening to know that the last two weeks, that was a maintenance uh, situation that was going on that I, that I had no idea about. And I think that those are some of the things that, uh, that are some of the concerns that are going on here today is the, uh, how this thing is governed uh, to make sure that in the future that this is not gold that's looking to glitter that's going to fade away in the future. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Okay, so that's, the, that's my main concern. And I ask all the adults in this room to just let's focus in on that one because the opposition and the people that are for it are making great points. And I think the one thing that we want you to get is to make sure that this thing is governed very well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? We'll make sure we get everybody. Come on up. Welcome. Uh, good evening. My name is A.V. Long, and I'm speaking for the Edge Hill Neighborhood Coalition. And, you know, it's very Ma disrespectful. Ma'am, you have to address so, the uh, chair, uh, thank, first of all. But me. Before my time starts, may I say that what I'm hearing in the audience from the other side is very disrespectful. Well, let's, we, we need, everybody needs to be professional. Let's keep this professional, so are you representing the Neighborhood Association? Yes, I am, representing the Edgefield okay. Neighborhood Coalition. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and I'm also setting my stopwatch so we can be uh, in well, And ma'am, the timer is right there so you can see it. Oh, okay, all right. Um, so, first of all, I would like to just address the main question that I know that we're all here for, which is, does this building meet the criteria of an educational use that meets the needs of its students? And for many of us, the answer is a resounding no. How can it meet the needs of public students if 95% or less of the building is totally off limits to these students? Now, we're hearing a lot of talk about the batting cage, and absolutely, we are for anything that benefits youth. We don't have a problem with the batting cage, but we have a problem with that second floor that will be inaccessible to students. That's what we have a problem with. For the sake of the youth in the Edge Hill and Nashville community at large, we're, we're okay with the batting cage. We understand that sports and the arts and other extracurricular activities are important factors in a comprehensive education plan. But many of us also know that these extracurricular activities are only a small part of a bigger plan. Yes, they are important, but not as important as targeted instruction that will produce proficiency in writing, reading, and math. When looking at whether criteria meets a use that provides for educational needs, you must consider that the need in Davidson County is for better test scores, and the need for the state of Tennessee is to move up on the national list from its current rank of number 35. 
Um, before I go further, I would also just like to address some of the things that have been talked about previously. Uh, Mr. Huddleston uh, was referring to the original lease, and that's not why we're here. We're here about this amendment. But let's just, but because he brought that up, now 60000 a year, 10% of that goes to Carter Lawrence, 10% of that goes to Rose Park Middle, which is 6000 So. I guess we all have different ideas about what value is maybe and what uh, and about money amounts. But to me, $6,000 for a whole school, that's really not a whole lot. Or do we appreciate whatever? Yes. But $6,000 when you look at $8,208 is spent per student in Tennessee. And for the national average, it's a little over 11,000. So you know, that's one of our issues, just the economics. And if you just really do the math, it's not adding up. And you keep having this talk about how much Belmont has spent on the facility. Uh, at this meeting, I've heard 13 million. At the zoning meeting, I heard 9 million. So if you have millions to spend, but we're talking about structures. We're not talking about programs. We're not talking about what's best for the kids or the seniors or other people in the community. We're talking about a building. So if you have millions to spend on a building, but yet you're spending less than one million to lease this land, um, that's, you know, there, there are some inequities there. And what is Rose Park Middle School receiving financially for this property? You know, if they were getting a new computer lab, if they were getting a sound video production studio, uh, that they could also share with other schools. If they, and if you want to do something on the top of that hill, how about an observatory with a, with a NASA-approved telescope? So, and people are saying that we don't care on my side, and that is so far from the truth. We care. Maybe we care so much, maybe we have a bigger vision for our community, for our youth, than the people who have been in charge so far. And, and there has been a lot of deception, a lot of distrust in this process, which is also what my side is working against. Uh, council mem members not communicating with us. We've heard a lot of talk about the resident association at Edge Hill Homes, and that's great. And we welcome any involvement, but, the, but Edge Hill Homes is not our entire community. And, our, and lots of people in this community have been blocked out of the system, have been ignored, have not been included. And that's one of the reasons why we are, we appreciate you hearing us tonight. We appreciate you bringing this to a public forum. Uh, a lot of the things, real quick, I think I lost a little time because of the disruption, if you just give me a few more seconds. But a lot of things that have been said sound really good on paper. They sound wonderful on paper. But I've lived in this neighborhood a long time, and we keep hearing about things that sound good on paper, but I have no reason to lie to you. A lot of those things don't manifest, and a lot of those things are not shared with the entire community. And the last thing, the $35,000, based on our information, 15,000 goes to the community center. The other 20,000 goes to RBI. People are really not being honest about the math, about the process, and about a lot of things. There's lots of, of favoritism, nepotism going on. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Joel Dark. I live at 1027 15th Avenue South. Um, I'm coming to more and more of these um, public hearings, and I don't think I've been to one yet where someone spoke both against something and also in favor of it, but I think that also is, um, maybe you've seen that before, but I, I, think it, it, I think that's indicative to some extent of the, of the nature of the issue, um, because I think all of us um, want you know, what's best for our neighborhood, also for the larger Nashville public. Um, I certainly can see a benefit to having this kind of facility. Um, the legal counsel at the beginning of the meeting uh, used the phrase, uh, the extent thereof. And I think that has been the sticking point um, from the beginning. 
Um, we were led to believe that this was a batting cage. Of course, it was much bigger than a batting cage. Um, and then in my experience, and I haven't been in all of the meetings, but um, much of the discussion has been about the second floor. Um, and I think that second floor, uh, which is a Belmont only, uh, Christian only, second floor on Metro Schools property, um, and Belmont full schedule control of the building, um, call into question whether this really is a public school building. Um, and in the same way that the maximum demands that were imposed on Rose Park in 2007 raised questions about the extent to which this remained a public park. Um, Bill Barnes, who has been mentioned uh, today, you can see him on YouTube. He did go over time, I'm watching the clock, <laughs> when he spoke to the Planning Commission in 2007. Uh, he concluded after the buzzer had gone off um, by saying that if you approve this, you will be buying the Brooklyn Bridge for $2. And I think that's all about details. So I would encourage you to look at the details. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, rebuttal, two minutes. Or actually a minute and 45 seconds, I remember. I want to be fair. But it, we can't really do that with our timer. So, Thank you all. Uh, Jennifer Bell, again, 1806 10th Avenue North. And on behalf of Metro Nashville Public Schools, I appreciate everyone's comments, both on the um, approval and, and opposition of these sides. I, I do want to remind the chair and the committee that this is civic use. The property um, is on school property. It is property that has been approved by the Metro Board of Education for use for this purpose. Um, it is civic use, which means that it is available to a community. And in that community, that includes um, Belmont students, our high school sports students, our youth who are gonna be able to have an opportunity to engage in sports for many for the first time. Um, I do appreciate all, all comments, but I also want to be mindful of those comments that are coming from um, our expressed feelings and those that are coming from our expressed facts. And when we're thinking about land area and, and rent per square, also keep in mind of are we comparing rent per square for public use or are we comparing rent for by square for sole use. Um, I also want to be mindful of the amount of time in which Belmont has access to this facility. Um, Belmont does have access to that second floor. Um, but as it pertains to the use of the first floor in those facilities for educational purposes, um, those are not limited at a certain percent. We have not created our schedules at this point. And I will be clear that Belmont University um, initially wanted Metro Schools to handle all of the scheduling. And from my own opposition, I was concerned about our ability to fund staff to do all of that oversight and scheduling. So that is the purpose and the rationale and so why Belmont is responsible for the scheduled use of this land. This use of the facility is available to students equally as it is to our high school sports, equally as it is to Belmont University. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else wish to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, that was a lot more than I was expecting to hear tonight. Um, but I do have to kind of take a step back to where we started the presentation tonight and what our legal counsel reminded us, which is that we are only considering whether or not um, this is consistent with planning principles. So, and I, and I looking at you, the staff recommendation, um, there seems to be a push for us to determine that this is truly an educational use and that that's consistent with the civic land use policy. Is that a correct interpretation of? Yes, that was our approach okay. um, to trying to unpack the various issues associated with this project. Okay, but everything that we've heard about lease terms and payment from Belmont to the, uh, the grants from Belmont, none of that is in our purview at this point. That's correct. That goes to council, and council lady Murphy can hear this all again in several weeks. Yeah, I mean, I think just, just for, we talk about this a fair yeah. amount here at planning, but just for the, the audience, there are lots of different entities at Metro that work um, on lease agreements and operational and financial issues 
and we tend and should focus on the land use issues and council um, tends to have much broader oversight over such issues. And one other question is um, private space and educational uses, is that something that we see other times? You know, I thought um, a lot of the comments that came in from the public were really thought provoking. Um, I mean, I stepped back, so I thank you. I mean, I stepped back and I looked at, okay, what is our policy framework with respect to leases? And I started to think about buildings that we have lease agreements. Um, you know, there's the Adventure Science Center, the Children's Museum here, or Titan Stadium, and each one of them is a little bit different. And I started to try to unpack, okay, are there land use issues associated with that? And again, I, I really am grateful because I think there are some fundamental principles that are worth a debate, maybe beyond the Planning Commission, about how we think about private spaces. I think there's been a lawsuit, the state's weighed in on that. So there's a whole history around some of those tensions. And I sort of landed on, um, this is maybe the middle or beginning of an important conversation as a city that we need to have. And so we're not gonna solve all of these questions here today. But, um, you know, we have a lot of different kinds of properties. And so certainly parks property primarily is for open space. And we rely on public-private partnerships to accomplish goals on parks property. And the lease agreements that we enter into on parks property certainly should prioritize open space. Um, you have schools property, which as someone noted, is in a different policy. And so perhaps we look at the lease agreements on schools property a little differently. And where we landed there was, if schools defines educational uses as academic, as athletic, as all of the things that go into making a successful student, which I think we can all agree we care about, then that to me is what we relied on. And so that's why in the report we asked schools to present information as to how the completeness of this whole proposal meets an education you know, an education use. And so um, I think if you had questions about how the second floor is gonna be used in program, that's appropriate to ask to the applicant. But I would say that schools needs to sort of define that threshold. They've certainly said the batting cage matters. Perhaps there is something that needs to be addressed about what those offices, office uses are going to function for, for what purpose. And then we look at it in total and say, yes, this meets sort of that threshold. Last but not least, I would just say, as somebody working in public service for a long time, um, you know, we, we have to come up with creative ways to help meet our needs. And that doesn't mean we like every lease or they shouldn't be scrutinized. I just think we're under enormous pressure in the public sector to try to come up with creative solutions. And so that's a different piece of this. Um, did that answer your question? <laughs> that does. And then I guess one just quick follow up, and you may not know this, but I mean, do schools lease out space to nonprofits? It's my understanding that, yes, site? do you want to answer that, Council? Right, so I'll say from a legal perspective, there's no um, prohibition or issue with a municipality leasing public land or public space to a nonprofit. I think schools um, actually um, is required by state law if they have empty buildings to lease those to charter schools. Uh, I know a number of uh, churches will have service at schools, so it is not uncommon and it's not, it's not illegal for the school to, or any uh, metro agency to lease a property to a, a nonprofit or to a profit organization. Okay. I'm just trying to understand the definition of an educational use and um, it's, this seems consistent. Um, I don't, th I think I'm gonna listen, let others ask some questions. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, although I think I understand, could you just, with your mouse, maybe, I just want to make sure I understand where the site is, because it's actually on the Rose Park Middle School little block, right? I don't know if your mouse can just show it, just so yeah. I can be clear. Um, that's correct. So the facility is um, in this general 
area here. Okay, so it's just that that area right there. Yeah. So when with the, the with the drive here, yeah, and then a, a reconfiguration of this parking space. So you here. did say that you looked at the expansion opportunities. Uh, was that correct, Lisa Wire? That was one of your criteria for that would in, in consultation with Metro Public Schools. Um, they indicated that this would not preclude them from any expansion or future redevelopment of the site if if that was on the table. Okay. Well, um, you know, likewise, I I would you know definitely. Um, encourage legal and counsel to make sure that uh, lease agreements are uh, played out, you know, spelled out so that they are, um, you know, the, the right interest for metro schools is uh, put in there, obviously. But like you said, we don't have any purview of that, but that's just my, my, my personal thing. Um, but also as a personal, I just talked to a principal recently who is asking you know, friends to bring uh, food for their kids, and you know, just because they they go home hungry. So I'm, it's hard for me to you not know, be compelled to you know go for where a neighbor is willing to. I mean, I'm not naive to say they're just doing it without some use on their own, but they're willing to. We'll we'll go into a partnership with you. Um, so Metro Schools has um, taken the lead on it. They're, it's going to be their building. So it, it's hard for me to vote against something or to be opposed to something where it is something to help our schools. I think we all hear the news of our schools, and I almost think that, uh, kind of as uh, Executive Director said, as creative solutions. We need creative solutions. We need more partners who are willing to do even more than this. So, um, and, and I was, that's why I was really curious about the area. Um, I may have had a different feeling if it was an, imp you know, real imposing area. Um, but it's right next to the baseball field, and um, it seems like it, you know, it would be a value to the school. They can do more for themselves. So uh, I, I'm pretty much, um, you know, in support of this. And it seems like it also is, um, it, it would take care of the things that we would be looking for on mandatory referral. Counselor. Thank you. Um, there is a lot, I've written a lot of notes since I get to decide on this twice. Um, I'm so fortunate, let me tell you. Um, and, and I guess a little caveat as I've been going into this, this is my first planning meeting as a commissioner. Um, it is likely that I will probably have issues like this before me often over the next two years where I may vote one way here and vote a different way at the council because I think every time I hear someone speak, I'm jotting down a different note. So you, sir, with the with the poor hair day, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, so so a, few, a few of my thoughts kind of bounce back and forth about um, that this is a, a private school, a private secular school, um, that will be definitely having 50% of this building is what it sounds like. Um, a thought ran through my mind, I, I have public and private schools in my district, is if this was another private high school or middle school offering to do this, how would that change our conversation and our thinking of it? Um, and and it is Belmont, so Belmont is bigger. Um, and as a Belmont alum, and actually as an RBI, uh, only one summer coaching. I don't know why that was just one summer. I'll take, you know, there could be many reasons. But but primarily, I think at the end of the day, we've got to come down on the taking Belmont out of out of this equation. If this was a corporation that was building this building on school property and letting the bottom floor be used for um, the after school programs and all these great programs that we heard about today, does that change the equation? Does that change the balance? Is it because Belmont is an educational institution that it swings it to being more of an educational use here when we're talking about civic land use? Um, and so that's where I'm going back and forth. Does the, really does the ends justify the means here of, of pretty much selling off um, the second floor of our, of this building because they're building it 
do we sell it off for 50 years for them? And I think this is a very public debate that we've been having at the council and in our most recent council elections and mayoral election when it comes to other public um, owned property and private development. Is this private development if we're only leasing it out and, and and balancing that. But I think at the end of the day, we, I mean, we, we do this with other organizations, right? The Predators have multiple spots that we've partnered with them and they, they certainly are not, um, a nonprofit organization. Um, Belmont is is a private school, but certainly no one is getting a huge paycheck. But I think again, you know, it's it's almost that that's got to be taken out of the the equation. And so my real concern is is the the percentage of this building being used for our Metro children. And as Commissioner Tibbs alluded to, we are in a budget crunch. I do not think that Metro has the money to build this type of facility for our children. And so are we willing to, to sell off for 50 years the second part of, or 50% of this building for the, the short-term use of these, of these children? And so that's where I'm going back and forth every few minutes with my decision, but I would like to hear, you know, who else has input and kind of some thought that could sway me one way or the other. Thank you, Councilor. Commissioner Elam. Thank you for all your thoughts. Um, one thing about the, the term of the lease, and I know that we're, we're kind of restricted in how we can interpret that, but as a civic use um, for 50 years, if the school shut down, which happens, if there was other, some other reason why the, the, the civic use went away, how should we evaluate that, given that we're committed to a 50-year lease? What if we, can we terminate the lease? It's probably a, a question of, of legal counsel if, um, and I know we always put them on spot, I apologize for that, but, um, or the director. But I haven't, I don't know what the termination clause is in, in the lease, I haven't thoroughly re reviewed it, but if it is a 50 year lease, my understanding is that even if the school portion of it goes away, their obligation to allow um, public access or public use of that first facility would continue. That wouldn't stop just because of the, the school went away. I'm but not that sure sort of restricts question. your ability to say sell the property. Potentially, we've sold schools before, school property, correct? You're saying if if the lease is still in place, would that restrict the ability to sell this specific portion of the Potentially. property? Potentially. I'm just looking at it from, you know, we're, we're, we're really thinking about the civic use. What if the civic, what if the use changes? Well, whoever, was, was looking to purchase a property would purchase it with that encumbrance of the lease. Um, so I guess from that perspective, the lease would have to be honored if the school were to go away and if Metro sought to, to sell off that piece of property. So then, um, really then, the, 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 the batting facility, it, it wouldn't really matter whether it was sort of upholding the obligation for it to, to benefit an educational use at that point. Because if it was a, you know, a hotel or a multifamily building, they would have a batting cage on site and it wouldn't be civic, but we wouldn't have to, wouldn't be obligated to uphold that educational use, right? Well, my understanding is that I don't know that it's limited to Rose Park Middle School or Carter Lawrence. So I wouldn't, I don't know that I'd say the civic use goes away. If there are other metro schools who are using this facility, they would continue to have access to that facility, even if this specific school were to close. Okay. And Commissioner, there in the, um, and we can get, because I think it's a great question, uh, we can draw your attention to the lease agreement and the MOU under item six, the term and termination, and ask Belmont's attorney how that would be handled. Oh, hold on, let's get you. Yeah. You don't need a mic. You don't need a mic. I'm just kidding. And if you'll Thanks. state your name and who you represent. Doug Sloan, uh, 6354 Torrington Drive, uh, and I'm representing Belmont. The, the lease agreement actually has 
is uh, almost any lease agreement with Metro uh, has a termination clause that Metro's uh, desire. If Metro wants to terminate this lease, then they simply have to give notice uh, to Belmont that they want to terminate it, and, and they can. Uh, now, if it's for cause, there's a, there, in the lease agreement, there's a number of obligations by Belmont. And if Belmont should fail at any of those obligations, then Metro can terminate the lease and, and there's no, nothing else to be done. If, however, as you've proposed, that the, the Metro decides they don't want to use Rose Park as a school any longer, but they still want to terminate the lease, then there's a valuation of the uh, improvements that Belmont has paid for that they would get a return on for the remainder uh, of whatever that lease term is. Uh, but as long as everybody lives up to what the lease agreement is for that term, then it just stays the same. Uh, again, Metro or Belmont has the payments that they have to make, but it's not just that. Uh, I know that that's a lot of what's been said about the lease is it's $35,000, but it's a lot more than that. They also have to do the maintenance of it. They have to do the administration of it. They're required to have personnel there to help with the training of it. Uh, and as far as the office space, there's only 5% of it for RBI, Metro, and uh, Belmont. Thank you, Mr. Sloan. Does that answer your question? Thank you, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, this is not easy, um, but so much of, I feel like the decision is, is based on the track record that Belmont has uh, um, established with the community. And in so many localities, I feel like big institutions, higher ed, the community is just begging those institutions to engage and come off their campus and engage with the community. And so, uh, you know, given what we've heard today, I feel like the track record of Belmont really is a huge consideration. So I'm, I'm leaning to support staff's decision. Commissioner Sims. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody in the neighborhood that's been engaged with this. Um, I have purposefully not engaged in this conversation so that I wouldn't have to recuse myself and I've purposefully stayed in a place where I've tried to be unbiased as possible. And I think those of you who know me know that I've done that. Um, this is tough because Edge Hill is the original African American community and with that comes an awful lot of history, much of it hurtful history, of where large predominantly white organizations have just run over this neighborhood. So I want us to be extremely sensitive to the fact that there's a lot going on here beside a mandatory referral. And that's not our job here. Lucy has cautioned me and I want to thank her because the regulations actually would have allowed her just to sign this and pass it on. But she felt like this needed to be discussed openly with as many people here on both sides as we could get. This is a tough decision, um, and any time there's a tough decision, I always kind of go back to the principles of good decision making. And I was lucky enough to get to study with a man named Dr. Schaffner, who is kind of the leading thinker in good public decision making. And he says there are two things that if you ever defile them, you can bet the decisions aren't going to be very good. And he says the first one of them is uh, the quality of, of information. Has all information been made available to all parties? And I can tell you that I've never seen anything about this park. I mean about this um, batting cage on the school grounds. I saw a lot of it when it was on the park, but nothing here. I never got a single notice about a community meeting. Um, the other thing that really bothers me is that um, although my heart has always been for the people who live in Edge Hill Homes, that's roughly 500 families. There are over, according to the last U.S. community survey, there were over 5,000 households in Edge Hill. That means 4,500 families have not been engaged at this table. And although I think that no one will argue that this is, you know, that sports are good for students, all that, there is an entire second floor here that is very questionable. It needs more information. It needs more community engagement, not less. And I don't know how, I actually think this is one of the vehicles, a mandatory referral is too 
small an instrument to carry this much freight. And I don't know how we got here without one public hearing, not one. And if Lucy hadn't opened it up, we wouldn't have had this one. And I just think that when we look at the very tenets of democracy, the very tenets of it, it means that we have transparent procedural regulations. And I don't think we've had it here. Ms. Haynes. Well, I hate to disagree with Dr. Sims, but I have heard this matter twice. I heard it two years ago uh, as the planning designee on the Parks Board, and we had multiple opportunities for public hearings. Um, several people have mentioned the difficulty of funding in our city, especially in parks. We've got to have more collaboration, as director said, more creativity. We've got that between TSU and Hadley Parks, who uses the tennis courts there. We have that with the Predators, as was mentioned. We have it with the Titans leasing it to TSU. Uh, we've got to be more creative and get greater utilization of our city resources. And this is a great opportunity to do that. Having heard this two years ago, uh, I think this makes perfect sense, and so I'm going to support this. So I would recommend approval of staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? There's a second. Any other discussion? Yes. Commissioner Sims. I think we need to, uh, mandatory referrals allows us to give advice to the Metro Council, and I think there are some comments I want to make sure go with that approval, so it doesn't look like it's just here, go for it. So I would like to put those forth as part of the proposal. The, uh, is, is part of the motion or uh, just part comments? Motion. Part of the motion. Well, so it's his motion, okay. but uh, why don't we see what the comments are because we okay. don't know what they are. So if, go ahead and state your comment. I think that a public hearing, this is not a public hearing yet the council is not required. I think we ought to advise the council to have a public hearing so that they get all that we got here. Um, I think the second is a 50-year lease is a long, long time to tie up any kind of public property. And I am concerned about item six that Doug just read, and Mr. Sloan just read. Um, if something happens and they don't get theirs, they want a, a fair market rate for being bought out. Um, but we're getting roughly 50,000 a year for 50, year, um, 50 years. If you just simply look at inflation, which is roughly 2.5% over the next 50 years, that would be a lot more money because right now what they're predicting is that $1 is equal to $1,100. And so there is no escalating mechanism in this contract. So let me say this about that. Uh, I think it's probably just off the top of my head to the, to the commissioners and see if you all agree or not as we try to be on the same page. Um, uh, the two issues that you're talking about. One is a lease issue, and I, I think that's kind of beyond our purview. It's more of a council issue now. We can recommend that they think look at the it. lease and, and make sure that it's a fair lease, and we can, we can say that. On the other, it would be recommending to the council public hearing. I don't think that we can say that that's a mandate of the motion, but that is part of our recommendation yeah. as an advisory role. However we need to say it, I'm fine with that. I just do you think that would be appropriate, Director? So, um, and Lisa, jump in here as our council rep. There's a rule that s sort of establishes council procedure. I always get a little uncomfortable when I talk about council procedure because they're very complicated. Um, so let me just say that, um, that it is correct that a mandatory referral is not required to have a public hearing at council. And then, Lisa, could you elaborate about how council would approach a recommendation from planning to, to have a hearing. Sure. So there are a couple of different kinds of um, bills and resolutions that automatically have public hearings at council. Um, one of them is beer permits, if you're seeking an exception. Um, and the other is zoning bills, so rezoning of property Th those sorts of things have an automatic public hearing. There is a rule in the council rules that is Rule 32. And what Rule 32 does is it allows um, any member of the council to um, ask that a public hearing be held on an item before council. Now, in order for that to happen, it does take a two-thirds vote 
of the council in order to allow for the public hearing. Um, yeah, that's it. So if you'll look at your staff report, the motion that, that we're making is that we are approving the mandatory referral for lease agreement, and that is what we're doing here. We can urge the council to have a public hearing and we can urge the council to look at the lease, but what we are approving is that, for the record, uh, that this is a, an approval of the mandatory referral for the lease agreement, and that's the motion with the two urging. Are you okay with that, Commissioner Haynes? And Commissioner Sims? Commissioner Haynes, you okay sure. with that? All right, so any, we have a motion and a second, we're on discussion. Any other discussion? The council lady, she's heard what we've said, so hopefully she'll take that to the council. <laughs> Counseling. Welcome yeah. to the planning as I, as I press my button before you yeah. recognize me. Yeah. Um, I so again, kind of going into this role, just so you all know, um, I, I feel like I've got a dual role here, right? Like, so I'm here representing the council and the public ish, um, because we're voted in by the public. But I also feel that when I go back to the council, my role is also to carry y'all's message there. And so I, I will make that commitment to make the motion um, in, in coordination, speaking to our legal counsel to let the other council members know. Um, and, and we'll bring it up in planning committee and make that motion for the public hearing because it sounds like that is something that um, I think would be supported here and is, is somewhat necessary. So I'm happy to do that do that there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Lady. And I uh, work with the, obviously the director and you can work on that with Council and Lisa, because I know Lisa spends a lot of time at the council meetings. Oops. All right, so any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? It's unanimous and the ayes have it, it's approved. So it is, we've been here uh, two hours and 15 minutes. We probably need to take a break. If that's okay with the commissioners, and then we'll finish the rest of our business. I do want to thank everyone for coming down and spending your time with us tonight. Commissioners and, and, and you all, so I, I do appreciate that. Um, as my daughter would say, Daddy, I gotta go potty. Okay. <laughs> So we are on to item two um, that was on the uh, consent calendar, but I believe that the opposition has, has left the room, but I wanna, let's, let's make sure. So is there anyone here to speak against item two? And, and let me, the item two is the South Nashville Community Plan Amendment, which was on the consent agenda. For now or forever, hold your peace. Okay, so no one here opposes item two. So commissioners, we can place this item back on the consent agenda if that's the will of the commission. Is there a motion to do that? So moved. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of placing item two back on the consent agenda, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it unanimously. <clears throat> and that is passed and on the consent agenda, item two. Now we're on to <laughs> item 3A and 3B. The next item on the agenda is item 3A. The request to amend the Bordeaux Whites Creek Haynes Trinity Community Plan by changing from T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving Policy to T3 Suburban Mixed Use Corridor Policy. Staff's recommendation is to approve. As a side note, the area in this graphic outlined in red represents parcels that are part of the amendment request. The study area which staff developed includes an additional parcel immediately to the south. As you can see, the study area is outlined in a black and white line. The proposed plan amendment study area is located north of the Clarksville Pike Ashton City Highway intersection along Clarksville Pike. Existing site conditions consist of vacant land and unimproved right of way. This particular request includes a variety of parcels lumped together. The site is located in the R10 zoning district. 
This request proposes to change the land use policy from T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving to T3 Suburban Mixed Use Corridor. T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving Policy encourages moderate to high density housing, mixture of housing choices, and improved connectivity of a neighborhood. T3 Suburban Mixed Use Corridor Policy encourages the creation of suburban mixed use corridors, support a mix of higher density residential and mixed use development. T3 Suburban Mixed Use Corridor Policy encourages a greater mix of higher density residential and mixed use development. This policy intends to enhance suburban mixed use corridors. On August 26th, staff hosted a community meeting at YMCA on Ashton City Highway to discuss the applicant's request, which also has an associated SP uh, application as well. Approximately 26 people attended, along with the applicant and staff. Attendees consisted of property owners and concerned citizens. Staff spoke and answered questions regarding the plan amendment process, while the applicant discussed their reasons for the request in detail. Reaction to the request um, was mixed. Concerns included impact on, potential impact on traffic and sidewalks within the immediate area. There was support for, there seemed to be support for the opportunity of additional land uses to be located closer to Clarksville Pike um, that would provide additional services for the immediate neighborhood. Staff will explain why the request for T3 Suburban Mixed Use Corridor Policy is appropriate in this location in the following slides. One. The portion of the site closest to Clarksville Pike is designated as a Tier 1 center, as you will see in that orange uh, color where the cursor is located on the graphic. The remaining portion of the site is closest to the neighborhood, is designated as transition or infill, as denoted with the yellowish color where the cursor is located on the screen. The concept map also designates Clarksville Pike as an immediate need high capacity transit corridor, as you see here in the thick blue line along Clarksville Pike. Slated for near-term improvements to transit service, allowing a mix of uses supported by T3 suburban mixed use corridor policy and locations with convenient access to major transportation and transit networks, existing and planned, on a primary corridor to downtown Nashville is appropriate. Two, policy application. T3 suburban mixed use corridor policy is intended to create suburban mixed use areas that provide a mix of land uses near centers and corridors. This site consists of vacant parcels. Uses along Clarksville Pike consists of commercial and industrial uses as denoted in red and blue on the graphic. The interior of the adjacent neighborhood consists primarily of single family residential development as you see denoted in the yellow toward the east on the right side of the graphic. T3 suburban mixed use corridors, intent of creating suburban mixed use corridors that provide a mix of land uses near centers and corridors makes this an appropriate application of the policy. Three, surrounding policies. Application of the T3 suburban mixed use corridor policy to the site would allow the opportunity for additional services for the neighborhood that can develop in a compatible and balanced manner along Clarksville Pike. Currently, T3 suburban mixed use corridor policy covers a narrow area on the east side of the corridor where the cursor and where the site is currently located in this graphic. Whereas the policy covers a significantly larger area on the west side of the corridor, as denoted on the graphic where the cursor is located in the hatch, beige, and yellowish color. Extending T3 suburban mixed use corridor policy to the site would allow for the consistent application of policy along both sides of Clarksville Pike that would lead to balanced development on each side of the corridor. As you can see, it's fairly deep on the west side of Clarksville Pike versus on the east side is more of a pinch point where the site is located. Transportation and connectivity. Clarksville Pike is classified as a five-lane arterial boulevard by the Major and Collective Street Plan. Ashland, Ashland City Highway is classified as a five-lane arterial boulevard. WeGo provides bus service on Clarksville Pike with nearby access to one inbound and outbound bus stop located near the Ashland City Highway and Clarksville Pike intersection with the outbound and inbound bus stop. Bus stops are located outside but near the site. In conclusion, staff believes the amendment request is suitable for the following reasons. One, greater mix of uses is encouraged along an immediate need high capacity transit corridor, in this case, Clarksville Pike, by National Nexus Growth and Preservation Concept Map. Two, T3 suburban mixed use corridors intent of creating suburban mixed use areas that provide a mix of land uses near centers and corridors makes this an appropriate application of policy. Three, adequate infrastructure consisting of transportation options, connectivity and access 
is in place to support this request. Four, T3 Suburban Mixed Use Corridor Policy would allow the opportunity for compatible development to occur as an extension of existing T3 Suburban Mixed Use Corridor Policy along this section of Clarksville Pike to allow development to occur in a balanced manner. Given the aforementioned, staff, recomm staff recommends to approve. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> and, and do we, is that 3A and B? Correct. Perfect. This was 3A and then 3B. And 3B. And so, uh, commissioners, what we'll do, you know, we hear the public hearing on both and then we'll take a separate vote. We obviously have to vote for 3A first, uh, the community plan, and then 3B. All right. Thank you, Gene. Uh, we'll open this item for public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry, 3B. I'm getting ahead of myself. 3B. See him. The next item on this evening's agenda is item 3B, the Clarksville Pike Mixed Use SP. This is a request to rezone from R10, CS, and CL to SP zoning to prevent a mixed use development. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions subject to the approval of the associated plan amendment. If the plan amendment is not approved, staff recommends disapproval. The approximately 11 acre site is located at the intersection of Lawrence Avenue and Belfield Avenue. Several of the parcels included within the site contain existing commercial uses. The larger parcels located at the rear portion of the site are currently vacant and contain dense vegetation. The major and collector street plan identifies Clarksville Pike as a major arterial street, which is the street you see where the cursor is located now. The site is currently zoned R10, CS, and CL. R10 is intended for single family residences and duplexes. CS, commercial surface, and CL, commercial limited, uh, permit various commercial uses. The policy for the site remains as previously stated in the previous presentation. The proposed policy again is T3 Suburban Mixed Use Corridor. There's a small portion of conservation at the rear of the site which identifies a small portion of steep slope. The plan calls for a mixed use development, including a maximum of 500 multifamily residential units and a maximum of 100,000 square feet of non-residential uses. The non-residential uses um, will be the uses permitted by the MULA zoning district. The plan consists of seven mixed use and multifamily structures along the front portion of the site. The rear portion of the site contains attached townhome structures. The plan calls for two points of access on the Clarksville Pike through a new public street and a new entrance only driveway. The new public street, Lawrence Avenue, will provide the main entrance to the site and will intersect with an extension of Belfield Avenue. Lawrence Avenue traverses the site in a north-south orientation, where the mouse is located here, and Belfield Avenue traverses the site in the east-west orientation, where the mouse is located here. The site plan establishes three separate zones throughout the site with specific standards for each zone. Zone one contains five structures, two of which will contain a mixture of residential and commercial uses with the remaining three stru structures containing multifamily dwelling units. Zone two contains two multifamily structures along with surface parking located at the rear of the structures. These structures will front Lawrence Avenue. Zone three contains attached townhome structures which are accessed from Belfield Avenue and are served by a network of alleys. The townhomes will all contain rear loaded two car garages the majority of the townhome units will front onto open space courtyard areas within the interior of zone three. The maximum height for the site is limited to five stories within 75 feet for the mixed use and multifamily structures. The townhome structures are limited to 45 feet in height. The plan provides architectural standards pertaining to, but not limited to, glazing, materials, stoops, and facade articulation. The site plan includes a provision requiring landscape screening along raised foundations, which exceed four feet in height, given the existing topography on the site. Um, the landscape screening will be reviewed by Metro planning staff with the submittal of the final SP site plan. Parking will be provided in the form of structured garages and surface parking per the requirements of the Metro code. Bicycle parking will be provided as required by met the Metro code. Sidewalks meeting or exceeding the major and collector street plan and the local street standards are provided within the site. In conclusion, staff's recommendation is to approve. The plan is consistent with a proposed T3CM policy as the policy is intended to encourage a greater mix of higher density residential and mixed use development along the corridor. The plan calls for mixed use development that would provide additional housing options and additional housing density. 
The plan and the architectural conditions are consistent with the suburban nature of the policy. The plan will enhance, enhance the pedestrian realm and increases connectivity for pedestrians and vehicular traffic. Therefore, staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without, or disapprove with, excuse me, approve with conditions subject to the approval of the associated plan amendment and recommend disapproval if the plan amendment is not approved. Thank you, Patrick. So we will open uh, the public hearing for items 3A and 3B, and like I said, we'll have to vote on those separately after we do that. So the applicant has 10 minutes, and you can save two of the 10 for a rebuttal, and please state your name and address. Thank you. So my name is Elizabeth Gatlin, and I'm the architect on this project, along with Ben Miskelly with Kimley Horn, who's one of our civil engineers on the project. Uh, we've been working with the seller to come up with solutions that meet the community needs and have also met with council concerning this bill. It's a new council member, and she is in support of this as long as we're meeting with the community and continuing to engage with them. We've met with the community twice, and in both instances uh, received support from different community members living and working in the area. Their number one request was that the development that have that the development provide more access to amenities within their local community. Uh, they listed off some commercial needs and wants, which speaks to the policy change needed to bring commercial space into the site. They said they would like healthcare related tenants to go into those commercial spaces, uh, local urgent care, pharmacy, physical therapy, dentist, medical office, chiropractic, and home care services. They said they would like a mix of retail and hospitality, grocery and food, convenience stores, restaurants, boutique and locally owned shops, health and beauty. They mentioned uh, that currently there's not a lot of access to local amenities within their community. They also mentioned they'd like office space, co-working and business suites, live work options and an insurance office. For residential, they wanted apartments and a mix of unit types, which we are providing in this. Uh, that includes retiree, or possibly senior living, and then uh, moderately priced townhomes. Uh, the community also mentioned they wanted more parks and recreation, uh, that they wanted to preserve some of the open space that's currently within the overlay of the area, which we do and provide a pool and grill and game access along with transit and greenway access and preservation of some of the natural landscape. In our plan, we obviously tried to give the community everything they wanted. Uh, the, I worked with uh, Cumberland Region Tomorrow, which is a quality growth organization in Middle Tennessee, and pro by providing mixed uses, uh, you basically allow for people to grow and work, live, and operate locally, which is something this project does. Uh, we're also kind of phasing the project from a cost perspective. So phase one would lend itself to then help fund the development as we move down the site. So uh, obviously you all are aware you, you can plan all day, but if the numbers don't work out, it never happens. So we've taken a lot of care with the community and with Kimley Horn and with the development and running the numbers in the market to make sure that this is actually a feasible development from a number standpoint. Um, we offer mixed use density and we are also offering uh, and proposing that many of the units are at local market rates instead of our booming Nashville market rates. So we're being very sensitive about the units and adapting our plan to meet those needs of the community. And then the massing, because this is a really hilly site, uh, we're doing kind of some special stuff with stepping and uh, deconstructing the architecture of the site. As you move back in to a more residential area, we're deconstructing these buildings as you see as they move up the hill, uh, they become less and less chunky. And from a constructability standpoint, we're also deconstructing them so that we're not having to dig, which is cost prohibitive. And then I'll let Ben speak to uh, more of the engineering on this project since they've been working with grading, earthwork, transit, and um, traffic counts. 
Thank you, thank you, commissioners. I'm Ben Muskelly, uh, Kimley Horn, 214 Oceanside Drive, Nashville. Um, first, to talk about kind of the future context of this area. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about it, but TDOT currently has a plan to widen and improve Clarksville Pike from downtown all the way past the site. That project is in letting right now. They are, are generating their short list of contractors, and it is a 30-month construction timeline on those. So Clarksville Pike will be improved, which it has a myriad of just different uses and different improvements along the site, as well as the signal at our site, the realignment of Ashland City um, to line up with Courtney Avenue. Um, as Gene and Patrick said, uh, Nashville Next really pushed hard with a volume policy and then the mixed use corridor at the front of this. Our policy change to kind of speak to that is really only for use. It's not for density, it's just to bring the use a little bit further into the site. Lawrence Avenue and Belfield Avenue, the two roads you see, are actually currently platted right-of-ways. So Metro put those right-of-ways on the site a long, long, long time ago. So this is kind of the first opportunity to see the site actually build that infrastructure that Metro had in place. As Liz said, we, we've tried everything we can to step this thing up the hill to involve contacts with the community as we get closer into the single-family <laughs> residential neighborhood to go into a less intense townhome use and really bring some uses to this area and to create a spark. Um, we've provided the community open space on the front and we just, we really feel passionate that this project will help improve this community and just create a destination for Clarksville Pike. Um, with this, we have spent a lot of time coordinating with uh, Metro Planning and with Metro Public Works and we appreciate all of their input and feel that that has made this project better in the long run. Um, with that, I would save our time for rebuttal. All right, we'll save two minutes for rebuttal. Appreciate you coming down. Anyone wishing to speak in support of the project? Come on up and you have two minutes and state your name and your address. We appreciate you coming today. Hello, thanks for your time this evening. My name is Belinda Van Atta and I'm the sole owner of this property. My husband, Jerry, having passed away a few years ago. Um, this property consists of 10 individual contiguous parcels. He purchased the first one uh, in about 1972, and then we purchased the other nine in um, three different purchases between about 1998 and 2009. Uh, we lived on this property for 15 years before we moved uh, in... Um, 2005, and I'm sorry I forgot to say my address, which I live in Gallatin at 145 Tennessee Shores, but I am still the owner of this property. Um, so we lived here for 15 years, and um, my husband ran a business out of it uh, from time to time, various different things, but at one point, we read that there were 30 to 40,000 cars that pass this site every day. And that's not a statistic that I can uh, pull up for you all right now, but that is what I remember from reading a few years ago. So it came to the point where it just wasn't a tenuous place for us to live as a family. Uh, these buildings, there are five buildings on the four front properties. These buildings are all very old, having been built in probably the 40s and 50s. And I think with uh, especially the um, widening of Clarksville Pike, that it's time for something to happen out here to improve Bordeaux. Uh, many of the community have told us that they want um, restaurants and we need to get some density of people out there um, to pull all of those things. So um, I think it would be a great opportunity for the community, and I hope you all will approve it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Come on up. Welcome. Evening. Uh, I'm Pat Cheek. Live at 2814 Canterbury Drive, Springfield, but I also own property on Courtney Avenue, which, if you look there, is on Zone One. So I own uh, 2117 
and my son, Ryan Biggs, owns 2115. He bought it three, four years ago, and I've known that neighborhood for a long time because I had friends that lived there, and when Verlon Witherspoon passed away, we bought that property. It's a nice, safe neighborhood. You know, we like that property. I never thought there'd be development in that area, but as you can tell, Buchanan Street, North Nashville, East Nashville's developed. It's coming our way. I'd like to see this type of development, so I'm in, in a, a approval for it. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? <coughs> All right, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Welcome. Is it on? Yes. My name is Deborah Bell. I live at 3306 Curtis Street. I totally oppose this because you're putting that many apartments. They're going to be coming out Belfield. That means they're going to be coming out Curtis, which is going to take them to Trinity Lane. There's no red light there. I have lived in Bordeaux 62 years of my whole life. I've always heard there was going to be a red light at Courtney and Ashton City Highway and Clarksville Highway. There is not one there still today. And I've lived there all my life. And like I suggested in one of the meetings, if you want to build homes, build $850 to $1,000 homes for older people that cannot climb these three-story stick houses and let it be for older people. Let it be for like the homes that are in our neighborhood. There, there's a seven pointer and an eight pointer buck right now at the top of my road on Curtis Street. There's wild turkey up there. Y'all are killing our wildlife. And I just totally oppose of it. And I hope that y'all take that into consideration. Let there be some wildlife. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, two minute rebuttal. So to speak to the development and the density that we are proposing, um, there are over 23 multifamily uh, projects within a two mile radius of their site. There, as of a um, couple months ago, 208 new construction homes within the two miles of our site. There are over six new three story homes within a quarter mile of our site and then 16 new construction homes in less than a mile from our site. There's also three transit stops that will help with traffic concerns, and that was one of the major concerns. Also, to speak to her concerns about retirement and uh, giving access to housing for the elderly popula population. Phase two of this project up in the corner, we are proposing to do 55 plus community there and also providing health care for those tenants with some of the commercial space. We'll have to find a management company to take that on, but that is something that the community does want and that's something we're designing for in our plan. And real quick, as a um, condition of approval, we have to, if TDOT does not, which is part of their plan, they will be doing, we have to construct a traffic signal at Courtney Avenue and Ashland City Highway. So if this is approved, we have to do that or TDOT has to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Blackshear, you want to go first? Um, well, to what the applicant just said, there does look to be extensive traffic and parking recommendations um, that will go along with an approval. So hopefully that will um, alleviate some of the neighbor's concerns. I know that um, one of the one of the community <coughs> members talked about development coming this way in East Nashville being developed in North Nashville being developed, but. Um, Bordeaux is a more intentionally suburban area, so I, I can definitely see why um, there would be a little bit more attention on the traffic and not wanting to increase it um, in a manner that would be harmful to um, the neighbor's way of life. And thankfully, there already is 
um, construction underway to widen Clarksville Highway, which will be helpful. I do have a question, um, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm orienting myself correctly. If you are going no south on Clarksville Highway, how would you access this site? If I'm, if I'm like thinking of it correctly, it seems like if you were going north on Clarksville Highway, you can make a right into this site, but how would you cross over all of those lanes to get into it from the left? As part of the Hold on, sir. We, if, if you could, uh, is that a question for the developer? What, we're going to ask staff, and then we'll call you up if, if we need if we need to. Lisa? Well, anybody who could answer it, I yes, guess. Yes, yeah. um, <clears throat> Excuse me. With the, there is a requirement for the addition of a t uh, left turn lane, so a continuous turn lane so it's, with Clarksville Pike. It's just a turn lane, which will be hard. Well, two lanes and a turn, yes. Okay, yeah. I mean, depending on what time of day it is, it will be hard to um, to make that turn. Luckily, if you're just having that as a left turn lane, you're not blocking the rest of traffic that's trying to go straight. Um, there is a signal. I'm sorry, I was trying to read okay. all these traffic conditions and I got down to Clarksville Pike at driveway one, which you'll see on page 32, does indicate the construction of a traffic signal with south southbound left turn protected. Um, at that project entrance, okay. so it is a signalized entrance. That would be helpful, because it could get dangerous trying to turn into that area um, at various points in the day. Um, I actually live in Bordeaux myself. I travel Clarksville Highway and or Ashland City Highway literally every day of my life, so I'm familiar with the area. Um, it does look to be a general improvement of what is there now. I certainly understand what the um, neighbors are saying about wildlife. We have wild turkeys in my neighborhood too, which kind of scares me sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it is something that we don't want to lose. Um, I guess we have to make um, judgment calls about what we think is more helpful at certain sites. And certainly we will continue to have wild turkey and deer in parts of Bordeaux, but um, if this area is developed, and it's very close to Clarksville Highway now, so it's, I mean, it's probably not an ideal place for wild turkey and bugs to be. Um, I, I generally am in support of this um, plan, and I'm interested to see what other commissioners have to say. Commissioner Sims. Um, can I see how much green space, this is a lot of density, and I wanna make sure they have enough of what we're, green space is our, that our plan calls for. So. We do have a few areas of green space included in the plan, and I'll um, point those out with the mouse. So uh, large green space here, fronting Clarksville Pike, um, small green spaces within the interior of these mixed-use um, areas, of these mixed-use structures here, as well as um, pool amenity and small green spaces in the interior courtyards. Um, we do have two large open areas here, but these will function as stormwater and will be landscaped as well. Good, okay. Um, and then I always get just a little bit um, chagrined when I hear somebody say that something's going to be like 55 plus, because I think that's something the neighborhoods really has asked for, something you just verbally committed to. But then it's nowhere in this, and so I'm not sure how we handle that, because I know I've only been on the commission for two years, but I can hear people go, well, they said they were going to do this. Well, and then we have no recourse. So. So when we're reviewing um, a development like this, um, we're reviewing it from the land use perspective, and this would be treated as multifamily <coughs> because of the form. Now, any sort of age restrictions um, for housing is not something that we as Metro would be involved in enforcing or restricting. <coughs> there are fair housing implications um, and limitations, and so um, they can, Commit that to the neighborhood, but that's not something that Metro can condition. Thank you. I just want to make sure the neighborhood knows that that's not something we can do. Commissioner so. Hill. Question about density for staff and just uh, um, looking at the SP zoning um, and the, the requested um, uh, policy change and how those correspond. Certainly. So the the most intense um, the most intense density is within the area that is proposed to be changed to the mixed use corridor policy. Um, that's the part that is closest to and oriented towards Clarksville Pike, which is also tier two center within Nashville Next. And so that's where we would be looking for um, the most intensity. There's a range of densities that would be appropriate within. Um, 
um, mixed use corridor policy, those are certainly some of the most dense within the county. Commissioner Haynes, no comments. Council lady. <coughs> Thank you, I do have some questions. So I see that it says in the conditions that it's a maximum of 500 multifamily residential units. Um, so that includes the attached townhomes, is that correct? So it seems to me that there are, there's a lot of buildings on here. Um, and do we have a breakdown of where those units are gonna be other than the 71 attached units in the back? So you'll see um, the, the, the mixed use buildings, the ones that are labeled mixed use, which would be the large sort of L-shaped building that's along Clarksville Pike would have mixed uses on the bottom and then residential above. Um, the, uh, the grouping of three units, uh, one long, two above it to the north on the western part of the property, um, those are all multifamily. Um, and then there's a couple more smaller mixed use buildings. And so it's a combination of stacked flats within a multitude of buildings. The ultimate mix would really depend on some of the non-residential space as well, because they would have the capability to have um, some non-residential uses. And so ultimately we won't have an exact breakdown of the numbers per building. That's something that would be um, figured out at final. But what we do at this stage is kind of establish those maxes, the maximum square footage, the uses, the maximum number, um, and, is, and then the configuration of the exact numbers would be d determined at final. I just think that this is a lot of building, um, a lot of dense building. Where are there parking garages in these multi-use? Okay, so that's what I'm not seeing, is that there there's parking, I guess, underneath or tucked within. Um, and is that the same little, the looks like W's or something? Is that little garages, I guess, for the... Attached, okay. So those are two car garages for the townhome, townhome units and then the mixed use and uh, stack flat buildings are a combination of structured parking, multi-level garages and um, surface parking. Okay, and then on the, on the overview map, one of them, it had the green network um, above these parcels. Is that um, metro owned land or is that just um, land that is green? That may have been part of the plan amendment slide, sorry. Back up some more. Do you have more? There was one that said, yeah, yeah I guess it's it. it. Oh, it looks, oh, the colors are totally different up here <laughs> in the down there. <laughs> Learning every day. Um, so, so give me a little bit more detail of that green network. Is that dedicated green space that Metro has or is that privately owned property? So the green wood network uh, generally speaks, uh, it generally speaks of privately owned property that pretty much speaks to the um, topographic nature or the, some of the environmental limitations of uh, a certain site or parcel. So in this case, there are some steep slopes back in this area. And so that green network, generally the intent of Nashville Next is for uh, that network to have minimal disturbance, if any at all. Okay. And so, to, and I guess I'm switching back and forth between y'all. I'm sorry. It's my first time. Uh, <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about how the, so a little bit of this is in the conservation policy, right? So I am not seeing, I see that there's green space being called um, stormwater amenity. I don't think I've ever heard of a stormwater area being considered an amenity. I mean, it's an amenity to hold water. Um, it's not like an amenity for green space. And so my concern here is that there's a whole lot of building, a whole lot of concrete. There's a little bit of a conservation policy here. I realize that's a, it's a small amount, but there is really not a lot of true dedicated green space in this plan um, other than patches here here or there. Um, and that's really concerning to me that we would have, we need the density on the corridors, and I like that this transitions back into the neighborhood, but I have a serious concern that there is not actual true green space here that I'm seeing. Tell me if I'm missing, so like what, it, what would actually be sure. more than like a front, these don't even look like it's enough to be called like a front yard. Sure, so there is the space that's between, and, and what you just kind of referred to in zone three, the space that's between 
those rows of townhome units, that is a, a width that is something that we would look for in a more townhome style development like this. It serves as a very functional open space for those areas. And so Patrick didn't point those out when he was kind of talking about it, but that really is a function. We kind of look at needing a width that's similar to the width of the buildings, and so we don't have kind of a canyon effect, and it can serve as a really functioning, usable open space. Um, in regards to the stormwater areas, stormwater areas now are not designed in the same way that we kind of think about stormwater areas. Um, in the past, and so what we're looking at now really is bioretention areas, and what that is is it's an area that's really gonna look and appear to be lawn with landscaping. It's not uncommon to have areas of that with a walking trail around it, such as what's done in this largest area that you see to the front of the amenity area, and that can really serve as a nice focal green space. While it might not be somewhere that you would go sit in the middle and picnic, it is an amenity because you're able to walk around it. It's more of a natural sort of green space. And so we try to balance green spaces between programmed and more passive. And that would be a more passive green space. And so looking at something like this along a corridor, the combination of green spaces that we have that are proposed, um, we feel is very appropriate given the number of units. Okay, I think I would like this project better if it had some sort of more um, dedicated designed walking trail through it, greenway trail through it, or some type of um, more where it looked like it was more pedestrian connected with green space. And that's something that we can take up. Um, hopefully that will come up at the community meeting and um, and hopefully could be addressed between now and, and council. And I will hold the council lady to that. And Jean, could you turn the microphone? We get some feedback. Thing. There, there we go. All right. Vice Chair. Um, yes, I'm glad you pointed out that the council lady sent us a letter and said that she was planning to host a community meeting before um, this goes to council, so that's good to hear. Um, I think anytime I see 500 units and 100,000 square feet, it does sort of raise concerns. That's a, a very large development. Um, on the housing side, I really wish we had some mechanism for some affordability, but we, we don't, I know that, but I, I just can't help but 500 units is a lot of housing not to have any uh, opportunity to encourage affordability. Um, but with that, I don't think I have any, you know, problems with this conceptually. Um, and I guess I'll make a motion to um, adopt staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any other discussion? We well, even, I'm sorry. So we need to, uh, like I, we need to make sure that the first would be a motion for 3A. I'll make a motion that we approve staff's recommendation on item 3A. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. second. Any more discussion? Seeing that, all in favor of 3A say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. 3A is adopted, which is a community plan. Now we need a second motion for 3B. I will make a motion that we adopt staff's recommendation of approval of item 3B. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? I'll make sure. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. And 3B is adopted. All right. We are on to item number nine. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a request to re uh, create two lots. And the staff recommendation, re recommendation is to approve the conditions. The property is located in West Nashville on the northeast corner of 
Crowley Drive and Columbia Avenue. The zoning is R8. The proposal is to create two lots. The proposed lots are 10,647 square feet with 75 feet of road frontage and 9,052 square, square feet with 60 feet of road frontage. The existing residence is to be removed. <coughs> Section 352 of the subdivision regulations outlines the criteria for reviewing infill subdivisions located within suburban neighborhood maintenance policy area. Staff reviewed the final plat against these criteria. Each proposed lot meets the minimum standards of the R8 zoning district. Each, each proposed lot has frontage on a public street and the current standards of all reviewing agencies are met. Because this is an infill subdivision with a maintenance policy, the community character criteria were applied. The subdivision regulations require newly created lots to be similar in size and frontage to the surrounding parcels. Surrounding parcels is defined as five parcels oriented to the same block face on either side of the parcel proposed for subdivision or to the end of the same block face, whichever is less. Because both of the newly created lots will front Crowley Drive, there was only one lot available to use for the analysis of compatibility, which is highlighted on map shown. The parcel is 15,544 square feet in size with a road frontage of 120 feet. Both lot one and lot two are smaller in size and lot frontage and road frontage than this lot. Therefore, neither lot one nor lot two meets the compatibility criteria. Section 352F of the subdivision regulation states that when a lot doesn't meet compatibility criteria, the Planning Commission may consider whether the subdivision can provide for the harmonious development of the community. The Planning Commission shall specify uh, whether or not the development pattern of the area has any unique uh, geographic, topographic, or environmental factors or development factors that are relevant information. Staff finds the proposed lots are harmonious with the existing pattern along Curly Drive across the street. The lots that are in this subdivision will create a similar uh, feel. There are similar in lot frontage, lot size with the lots across the street, which are highlighted on the map shown. The development pattern that this subdivision will create will be more complementary and compatible with the existing development pattern. Therefore, staff recommends approval with conditions. Thank you, sir. We'll open this item for public hearing and applicant has 10 minutes and can save two of the 10 for rebuttal. Welcome. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Lloyd Carney. I'm an attorney here in Nashville, and I represent the family of the applicants. And, uh, and I believe they've just drawn near here uh, beside me. I've gotten to know them over uh, the last few months, and, uh, and we have been working hard toward this through meeting with the Neighborhood Association over the course of about a year and a half to two years now to get this project accomplished. Uh, would you mind kicking off the, uh, the slideshow? And I believe you have printed materials before you, but you can probably see in just a moment uh, that I've created a slideshow. And you can go ahead and go to the second screen once you get there. Um, to underscore the harmonious development, there are three corner lots that by the original plat that you can see in the inset were designed to be a little bit larger than the vast majority of the neighborhood. And of those four total corner lots, all three of the others have already been subdivided into two lots, and this is the only remaining lot that is a, a corner lot in that manner, and we're requesting a compatible subdivision uh, to be congruent with the rest of the neighborhood. The next slide. Uh, surrounding parcels uh, has created a, an unusual result when we look at lot compatibility. And as you can see there, it's defined as the five parcels oriented on the same block face on either side. But because of, as Joran mentioned, the way that this block face uh, is situated, there's only one lot that is considered when we're analyzing lot compatibility. And so, and of course that is in bold there at the bottom. Therefore, one lot to the north of the newly created lot was used to analyze that compatibility. And you can see that one lot there, 546 Crowley. 
and I've also put an inset for the original uh, plat map that was recorded in 1944, where the plat was originally contemplated to be two lots. However, this homeowner has decided to merge those two lots, but still reserves the right to revert those to two individual parcels using that legacy lot line that uh, will remain in existence. As far as administrative approval goes, um, this subdivision would have qualified for administrative approval if any one of these four uh, um, uh, conditions had been met. If lot 38 and 39 had been used as individual lots as contemplated by the original 1944 plat, uh, if staff could consider the original plat character rather than the present use. Uh, if surrounding parcels considered the five full properties nearest rather than curtailing that comparison at the block face. And if surrounding parcels also considered the opposite side of the street. If any one of those things would happen, we would have lot compatibility in this case. And then I'd also like to point out, because of that legacy lot line at 546 Crowley, this subdivision will qualify for administrative appro approval when 546 Crowley Drive reverts back to two lots as a legacy reversion. It would then have lot compatibility. As it's been mentioned, the subdivision regulation there, uh, 3-52F, provides the board with the power to cure unusual, unexpected, and inharmonious application of the lot compatibility requirement. And the highlighted portion there really resounded with me. It requires harmonious development of the community, and that's the standard uh, that's before you today. And it's the position of the applicants at the, in the front row behind me that this is a textbook case for the application of that F provision. And you can see here a broader view of the neighborhood, and you can kind of speculate um, which lots would be compatible. Um, but if you'll go to the next slide, I've inserted a green star in the greater neighborhood on all of the lots that would be compatible with the proposed subdivision that's before you. Of course, the red stars are the lots that it would not be compatible with. So in uh, looking at your duties to draw back and look at a larger lens of the neighborhood to apply that F provision, uh, the green lots would support uh, a favorable decision today. And then with the harmonious development of the community statistics, I've uh, consolidated this for you for the map that we used that you've just seen. The subdivision would have compliant lot compatibility with 88.4% uh, of the properties that you saw in the slide presentation. But I also just looked at the original 1944 plat map, and that's the Crowley Wood subdivision, and it would have 84% lot compatibility with every lot in that original 1944 plat map. And so the next three pages that'll probably be easier to see than what you have before you, I've uh, made a list of all of the properties that are within the 1944 plat map, and every property that is in green are those lots that it would be compatible with. And as you can uh, scroll through those lots, it is the vast majority of them are 60 feet wide and also of a compatible acreage. And then, I think that I might have one other slide right there at the end. That is the 1944 plat map, which is probably useless on your screen, but uh, in the handout before you may be a little more helpful. And so that's our presentation. I'd like to reserve the balance for rebuttal. Thank you, sir. We'll give you two minutes for rebuttal per our rules. And is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Come on up. Give us your name and address, and you'll have two minutes. Appreciate you coming down. My name is Nanette Clark. I live at 6463 Old Hickory Boulevard, and I'm here as a friend of the family in support of the variance that they're asking for. This was originally developed in 1947. It's a pie-shaped wedge, and if you allow the variance today, it actually does put it back in compliance with the rest of the neighborhood. Uh, it makes the proper property congruent by changing it from 1.43 acre lot to 2.21 acre lots. 
the parcel as it stands is not currently harmonious with the other lots and awarding the family the variance would in fact bring the lots in line with the rest of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? All right, seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Appreciate you all coming down. Good evening. My name is Chuck Smith. Oh, but before you start, hold on, we'll get your time back. Yep, there uh, we go. There we go. We'll start them over. There we go. Hi, my name is Chuck Smith, and, and I live at 6207 Robertson Avenue. I am, with the, I am representing the James Robertson Neighborhood Association today. And we, we actually, I want to kind of correct a little bit what was said a while ago. They did come and meet with the Neighborhood Association, and we did say we were not in favor of the proposal they had before us. It was not accepted. They came once, and we said, no, we do not accept that. So just a, a point of clarification. In, in our, we had three points of opposition in this. And the first one, they would have been density, infrastructure, and neighborhood. Uh, density being one that the current plan is four times more dense than what is existing now. So I understand infill, infill alone will double the density of our neighborhood. That's one of the problems we're having now is that for every one home, we have two homes. And now we have six cars, and there, now we have a parking issue. So to bring some things into light, from Robertson Road to the end of Crowley going Sir, south. if you could use the microphone. I'm yeah, sorry. There we you go. Hear me? I'm, yeah, I, I have a hard Everybody time. Okay. can hear you with the microphone. Thank okay. you. Okay. So from Robertson Road to, to down Crowley to the end, there are 46 new homes. There are 68 more planned. This is less than a half a mile of road that has 100 homes that have either proposed or being built on this road. Now, understand that when I talk about infrastructure, I talk about roads. Our roads are, we're dealt the hand we have. Our neighborhoods have roads that we can't fix. I mean, they're not near wide enough. They don't allow for parking. They don't allow for the things that we really would like to have sidewalks, big one, sidewalks, yeah. So it, when I looked at Nashville Next, and I, I saw that, you know, Nashville Next says the lane should be 10 to 11 feet wide. I went out there today and I measured Crowley and I measured Columbia and both of them are 20 to 21 feet wide with no parking allowance there at all. If we were to have any parking allowance, we'd have at least seven more feet there. So there's no place for anyone to park on the street considering that it's only 20 to 21 feet wide. And last, I'd like to say that for a neighborhood we as a group met a while back, and I say this, this was the Sylvan Park, Charlotte Park, James Robertson, Nations, and we went over, what would we like to see in our neighborhood? And it's to maintain that neighborhood. And we understand the difference between the maintaining and the evolving, and we, we all have those in our neighborhoods. But this, this particular plot is in a maintenance neighborhood. You know, if I read, I don't think I need to read this to you, but if I read the T3, maintenance, it says we want to keep this neighborhood as it is currently, that we want it to maintain the look that it has. So I looked around and, and part of that was, part of the thing that bothered us the most was there are within a 1,200 foot radius of this property, there are 14 more properties similar to this that could be resubdivided, which would meet another 40 or 50 homes that we're not looking forward to have. We do not want this. Now understand, I'm a, I'm a lifetime resident of District 20. I'm 63 years old and I've lived there all my life. I have been in my, my place now for 40 years. I like the change to the neighborhood. We like the change to the neighborhood. We want to do it responsibly. Build the neighborhoods, do these, do these things. The infill's doing enough but on its own. So build responsibly, and this to me is not responsible. We have three other corners that he earmarked earlier, and we have parking problems on all three of those, those corners. Come, Monday morning, come Sunday afternoon when the ball games are going, there's four or five cars you can't hardly get around. So I just want us to realize that, you know, just because we can doesn't mean we should. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Come on up, sir. Welcome. Yeah, my name's Tommy Barnes. I live at um, 
<coughs> excuse me, 759 23rd Street. I'm down the hill going out from where they are. But the problem we have is when they put the interstates in, they chopped us up. You can either go out Robertson Road, you can go back around West, uh, West Bend and go out that way, or you can come down James Robertson. We got three exits and entrances, and we got a lot of stuff running through that neighborhood. Uh, you can't, I've, I've got a school drop off at the end of my street already, and you can't get out of my street because the parents are parking up and down both sides of the road at the road, and my road is way skinnier than theirs. We're down to about, uh, I think it was 18. Not much there. And every time we add another couple of houses here, we're adding another bunch of people, we're adding cars, and if you add two houses, you don't add two cars. I would imagine pretty much everybody up here has at least, what, three cars? At least, you got kids, you got one, your wife's got one. Uh, every once in a while, somebody comes over to see you. It, we can't get in and out now. And it's just, we don't need the extra. And I I'm, I'm realize that they want to break this up and they want the money, and I understand that everybody likes money. But I'm, I've been here, living here all my life too, and I can't get in and out. I can't, I can't live like I would like to in West Nashville. I was born on one side of Charlotte. I'm living on the other side of Charlotte right now, and I've always loved it here, but this is killing us. Thank you, sir, for coming down. <clears throat> Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing that two minute rebuttal. You know, I might not even need the two minutes, but I just wanted to point out that it's a, it's a well settled provision that uh, it's in your purview to look at the proximity of the residents, the comments uh, that come in by email and by, by speaker when you consider the impact uh, on, on your decision today. And, uh, and I just happen to have the opportunity to look at some of the statistics for the folks who left some of the earlier comments. And I noted that uh, of those residents uh, that spoke in opposition that were made of public record, that they were all an average of 0.94 miles away, which doesn't really have that situs impact that, that uh, you can see on some of the letters and some of the folks that are in support of the, the provision. Um, the property that is just to the north, 546 Crowley Avenue, um, uh, we have been told with some authority that she wrote an email in saying that she approved of it. And that is the one lot that is, uh, that is before you for lot compatibility or the one that you would consider for lot compatibility. Um, and I urge you to try to look through your materials and see if we can verify that her email came in. Uh, her last name is Caps, C-A-P-P-S. And uh, well, look, thank you. the family urge you to uh, adopt the, the recommendation of staff. Thank you. Seeing no one else wish to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Haynes. So legal counsel, can you remind us in subdivision regulations what our latitude and rules we should follow, please? Right, so you, uh, these are, um, when you're determining uh, whether or not to approve a subdivision, you're taking on a quasi-judicial function. These do not go on to the Metro Council. And so you have to make the determination of if this proposed subdivision meets the subdivision regulations. Uh, staff has reviewed this proposal and they have come to, um, or excuse me, they have made a recommendation to you but ultimately based upon your review of this proposal and your review of the, of the subdivision regulations, uh, you have to determine whether you feel that it meets the subdivision regulation. If you do feel that the proposal meets the subdivision regulations, then you should vote um, to approve it. If you do not feel that it meets the subdivision re regulations, um, based upon some material evidence, you should cite to that evidence and cite what part of the subdivision regulations you do, do not feel that it comports to. 
Thank you. Um, staff, help me understand the sidewalk requirements. If, if this were to move forward, would the applicant be required to install sidewalks on the two lots? It would have to comply with all the code's requirements for sidewalks. Okay. Um, I think both staff and the applicant have made a compelling case, and I'm going to support staff's recommendation. <coughs> Commissioner Blackshear. So here, the subdivision did not meet um, compatibility requirements, but I'm going to read straight from the analysis. I don't mess this up. Section 352F states that where a subdivision meets all other requirements, but falls short on compatibility, the Planning Commission may consider whether the subdivision can provide for harmonious development of the community. So it sounds like the staff did not have to consider whether it um, provided for harmonious development, but you decided to see if, the, if it provided for harmonious development. Um, and then the analysis goes on to state the Planning Commission shall specifically consider the development pattern of the area, any unique geographic, topographic, and environmental factors, and other relevant information. So some of the neighbors' concerns were, not all the neighbors' concerns, but some of some of the neighbors' concerns were infrastructure problems. Were, when you were thinking about harmonious development, what kind of attention did you give to some of those infrastructure concerns? Uh, we were strictly looking at development pattern in, in regards to harmony. Gotcha. So would it be, I don't know if this is for you or for a legal counsel, would it be appropriate to take into consideration infrastructure concerns when we talk about you have to consider any unique geographic, topographic, and environmental factors and other relevant information? Well, I think it it's hard to imagine like every possible scenario, but I think it's it's what uh, individual planning commissioner would consider uh, geographic, topographic, topographic, or environment, environmental factors. So, um, it, as Ms. Milligan said, it's it's tough to look at the. Um, the pattern, the harmony, and then also look at what might be here or what, without having specific evidence of what those concerns are. Um, I don't know if there was a traffic study. I, I know some of it seemed to be, um, I don't want to say opinion, but I, I don't know how much material evidence there is to support it, but you as a commissioner can make the determination that if that is your portion or if that is your definition of environmental factors, you can weigh that in your decision as to whether it meets the subdivision regulations. Okay, that was helpful. Um, we usually get these subdivision um, requests and we have to approve them because they meet all of these very objective criteria and here it seems to be, um, one, it's not even required that we consider whether the subdivision provides for harmonious development and if we decide to kind of go down that route, then we, have to consider what seems to me fairly subjective criteria in deciding that. Um, I think just by looking at the development pattern, I would agree that it would provide for harmonious development. Um, I am very empathetic to the neighbors who are um, maybe not completely fed up, but um, are a little upset about some of the infrastructure concerns and um, those not being met, but additional housing um, perhaps coming into the area. I am probably leaning towards approval because it does fit within the development pattern, um, but I would be interested to hear what other commissioners have to say. Commissioner Sims. Thank you, Commissioner Black. I've always learned from you, and I am intrigued when policy language says may instead of shall. And in this case, we are given a choice. And I wish the council person was here because I'm really concerned about why she's asked us to say no. And, um, and I try very hard to listen to our council people because they are the elected representatives of the people. We also got a lot of mixed letters. We got letters that were supporting and letters that were against it. And without her clarification about 
Um, and what she said was, I would like to continue to meet with the community and see if we can come to some agreement. So because we're not required to do this, my tendency is to vote no, but I'm going to wait and see what everybody else says. Commissioner Ewing. The, the issue of development pattern is, to me, is important. So I can see the, the, the correlation between uh, the, the surrounding lot sizes and what this, these two lot sizes would, would be. But it, I'm assuming, too, that the, there would be four houses that would be allowed potentially by right if, if, if this passes. Is that correct? <clears throat> that's correct. It would be two duplexes. Okay. So, so um, if that's the case, to me, the development pattern would be inharmonious because many of the, the lots that are surrounding are accommodating a single-family house. So how do we justify that or kind of wrestle with that? When we analyzed this, we looked solely at the subdivision of the land. Okay, so it's not, not gotcha. <laughs> Council Lady. Thank you. Um, so as y'all know, I've had many of these subdivisions in front of y'all and many of them have gone to court afterwards. So um, I'm very familiar with the subdivision regulations um, more than I ever cared to be. So that's probably why I'm here now. Um, I know that the neighborhood association has issues with this. Um, I can understand why you have issues with this. This is a development pattern that is very similar to parts of my district. So I, I hear your concerns. I understand them. I see them and hear them firsthand from my constituents. And um, even in my own neighborhood, which is not far from here, the White Bridge Road Neighborhood Association. Um, so, but when you look at the broader area, um, it does look like when you split this, it matches the, the other lots around it, um, which is demonstrated in the handout. Um, and so my concern, what I'm hearing from the neighborhood association is that there's a lot of houses going up, and I think that that was alluded to already, how many lots are here. Um, the infrastructure isn't there, very similar to Sylvan Park in my district. The infrastructure is old. We're having to do capital improvement budget amendments now to work on that. Um, but the difference between the other side of Charlotte, where I think you said you grew up, and, and this side of Charlotte is, is it's, Sylvan Park has been zoned single family. And when you look at this, dis, this area, it is still zoned R8, and nearby is zoned R10. And so when um, Commissioner Elam, I think, mentioned that all the homes around it are single family, they are, by right, I'm assuming they all meet the, the, the 8,000 square foot criteria, which they appear to be. By right, they can all be two tomorrow. Tomorrow they could go get permitted and all of these lots could turn into two homes. And so my, my recommendation to the Neighborhood Association and to the Councilwoman would be to start looking at, at rezoning because it does look like this lot um, and many of the lots on the corner that are similar to it it looks like the development pattern used to be that the corner lots were larger. I think I argued that with y'all over on Woodlawn, actually. Um, so, so while that was the development pattern, those bigger lots have been subdivided since since this was platted. And given the fact that the whole area could turn into two, and in fact, you know, she could probably file a zone change and get that done before this went to permitting potentially. Um, you know. I, I completely feel the neighborhood associations. I want y'all to know that. I understand it. I hear you. Um, but I'm also very acutely aware of the state legislature and the implications there. Um, and so it looks to me that the math adds up, unfortunately, on the against the neighborhood. And so that's where my very long-winded advice to y'all. And, um, and it looks like it meets the criteria legally. Vice Chair. There's a lot to unpack there, but that was a good analysis. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, and like my fellow commissioners, it's nice when we don't absolutely have to approve one of these. But um, sometimes you look at them and it's like, wow, that's really the way it was intended to be. Um, I guess one question, I, the houses are going to front onto Crowley, whatever, however it's redeveloped, they'll front onto Crowley. So you will still have the side of a house on that. Columbia 
The final determination would be made by codes on that one. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, as I glanced at the sort of aerial, I see a ton of redevelopment, and I think that the council lady is exactly right. I mean, every one of these lots could be two houses tomorrow, um, and that's going to significantly tax the neighborhood um, and needs to be considered, but I don't think that that's what we can do with this one lot decision. Um, so I will give that my time. Councilor, you have another? Sorry, I forgot one of my notes. So I know on one of um, these that happened in my district that uh, the com that y'all, I guess us now, um, had put uh, a con like mandatory sidewalks, mandatory s uh, shared access. Is that something that we legally could put conditions on the plat that, um, so I know that uh, the councilwoman rezoned her whole district into the UZO, but there's still ways to not have to build a sidewalk. So is it possible that if we approve this, we mandate that they, I, I, y'all can fix the language, I'm sure, mandate that um, there is uh, um, sidewalk on both all frontage and can we mandate that like the each parcel has to have shared access so there's not four driveways there there's only one driveway per lot is that something we can mandate so two answers to what seems like one question um, the infill regulations which apply to lots created on existing streets do state that you may place reasonable conditions um, necessary to ensure that the development addresses any particular issues present. Um, such conditions may include, um, but not be limited to, um, setback, um, access, easement locations, those sorts of things. And so I think certainly any sort of um, access criteria can be added. Um, sidewalks is a little bit more complicated. When the um, countywide sidewalk framework was adopted, um, the provision of sidewalks along existing streets um, was delegated solely to the zoning code. And so that is a function of the zoning code now, um, as opposed to where we're creating new streets, those sidewalks are still um, considered as part of the subdivision regulations, but for existing streets where this is, that would fully be a function of the code. So probably on access, shared drive, it sounds like to me. Is so that I got right? a yes yeah. on shared access, right? <laughs> okay, yes. just but, yes. And no on sidewalk. No on sidewalks. We, that I under the current regular, the it should be a sidewalk on all fronts. It should yeah. have that. We can always urge the sidewalk piece. That would be our intent. Um, can you urge on the plat? <laughs> I, I mean, it's just, just from comments. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. Um, so it's time to have a motion. Vice Chair. I'll make a motion that we approve staff's recommendation uh, that this meets the harmonious, what am I saying? That it, it is um, harmonious with the surrounding. With a shared drive. With the, oh, right, with the shared drive part. There we shared go. <laughs> Yes. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? It, Lisa, are we good with that? Or? Yeah, I can say it better than that. Can I, I just wanted to get clarification. <laughs> yeah, let's. it would help if you helped so, us. So, is the intent to have one drive per lot? Yes. Um, yes. Right. And would there be any sort of standard that you would be looking at in regards to um, width of the drives on each lot? We have some language that we will sometimes use. Um, if it's a single driveway to be a maximum of 12 feet in width, um, essentially if you have just one drive, it could be any kind of width. And so we have um, a standard that we essentially say that if it's a one drive per lot, that it be a maximum of 12 feet in width. Councilor, would that satisfy you? I think so, because, uh, I'm sorry for getting the feedback. Uh, I, I think we, it would not be a reasonable, I think we can only require one access per parcel. If we were sh if we were making the parcel share, that could be considered unreasonable um, because of the maintenance needs and agreements that would have to come with that. So one driveway per, and then I'm at the will of the body on width, I don't. I, it would probably no, be good yeah. to keep with our standard yeah. language of 12 feet, yeah. is that? 
I'm hearing it's 16. I'm getting a text. 16 feet, sorry. Sean's texting. <laughs> 16. Okay. Per lot. Okay. That's a. We're approving staff's recommendation um, and adding the condition that there is a six, one 16 foot wide drive per lot that's created. Bob, did you have something you want to say? I was going to say maximum of 16. Maximum of 16. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. All right. There's a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, Commissioner Sims, one no vote. All right, passes with those conditions, and we are on to item number 10. Well, let's, let's let everybody. She's still here. You survived. <laughs> All right, <laughs> item 10. Okay, item 10. Can you guys hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, the request is to rezone from one and two family residential R10 to residential multifamily RM 9A. Staff's recommendation is to approve. The nine acre site is outlined here in blue on the screen. Um, it is located at the terminus of Williams Avenue, um, just north of the area where Williams Avenue and Walker Terrace uh, intersect. The site has been developed with several detached single family structures, but as you can see from the aerial, is primarily uh, populated with trees. The subject site is shaded in in light gray. The surrounding properties are a mix of residential multifamily to the west and residential one and two family um, zoned RS 7.5 and RS 10 like the subject property currently is. Um, with the mix of multifamily to the west, the surrounding area is also um, primarily established with one and two single family residences. The policy for the site is T4, urban neighborhood evolving. Um, the intent for this policy is to um, establish different housing um, types, um, as well as improve connectivity throughout the area. Um, with the surrounding zoning districts and development, um, the proposed RM9A is consistent um, with these zoning districts um, and provide a transition between the multifamily and the single family. Um, in addition, the site is also large enough to accommodate any infrastructure needed um, to better serve the higher intensity of the site. Um, and the site is located within the Urban Services District. Um, therefore, sidewalks would most likely be provided with this development as well. Um, both of these would go towards achieving the policy's intent of improving connectivity and establishing a different use of housing within the area. Given the proposed rezoning is consistent with the policy and the development under the proposed zoning, RM9A would achieve many of the goals of the policy. Staff recommends approval. Thank you. We'll open this item for public hearing. The applicant will come on up in uh, 10 minutes and then two minutes if uh, of the 10 for rebuttal. Welcome. Thank you all um, for your service. That's too loud. Okay, um, I only get to be here sometimes. I know y'all get to be here all the time, so thank you for being here. Uh, Chip Howarth, 2606 Eugenia Avenue. I represent the, um, I, I guess we are the applicant in this case. I represent the owners of the property. Um, I, I don't have a ton more really to add than what Amelia has already added. I mean, we are smack dab in the middle of a neighborhood evolving policy, which among other things um, offer, is intended to offer more housing choices. Um, and, high, and increase in housing diversity and connectivity. Uh, we have RM9, which is what we're seeking directly to our west uh, and some, some of our sort of northwest right around us. 
Um, it would, you know, it's, we're not asking for any more intensity than what's already there. Our intent is to do sidewalks in the, sp in the site. We're going to have some green space. We've had a, a neighborhood meeting um, with uh, Council Member Van Reese's leadership. Um, had a neighborhood meeting, talked about what the neighborhood would like to see. I know some of them are here to tell me that um, things that they don't want to see. Uh, the intent is to have green space right in the middle, access not just for the community but for the neighborhood. So we're, we're excited about this and um, I'll reserve two minutes if I need to. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Anyone in, in council, we'll get to you last like we normally do. Uh, that way you can speak. Um, all right, so we'll, two minutes for rebuttal. Uh, anyone wishing to speak in support? Come. Oh. All right, seeing no one wishing to speak in support, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. We're a bit very official around here. <coughs> Welcome. Um, good evening. My name's Lisa Petrino. Oh, let's use, the, we got to use the microphone for the record. Just talking it, I think it's on. Um, good evening. My name is Lisa Petrino. I live at 1625 Liberty Hill Drive in Madison. Uh, I oppose this development because I don't believe our neighborhood can support as many homes as they are um, projecting. Um, we also, that area is also surrounded by other housing developments, and we have deer that come down. Um, I wonder if, you know, if it's been taken into consideration, the uh, ecosystems that live in that nine acres. It is probably one of the last um, wooded areas in our neighborhood. Um, where are those animals going to go? Um, and with the additional traffic, um, our streets are narrow and we have children that play on them and older uh, people that walk and I think it would just be a safety issue to have this many new people and cars coming in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Come on up. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephanie Lillard. I live at 1661 Liberty Hill Drive in Madison, and my home is right at the end um, of their property where they want to con do the connectivity. And um, like she was saying, we have kids, we have older people who walk in that area. We're not against having development, but we think that that's too many homes to have in that area where we already have traffic with our own vehicles, if we put that many houses that they were projecting in our meeting, 77, double that with cars, that's gonna be too much traffic and considering that as a safety issue, not only for the kids who play in that area, but for us to get in and out of our driveways, get in and out of our homes. Um, we already have people who speed up and down Williams Avenue or use it as a cut through from Gallatin Road to Old Hickory, that's gonna double um, that traffic that we already encounter. So maybe if they couldn't, if it was not as many homes being on that site, it would be better than having so many on that, on that site. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Come on up. Appreciate your patience and coming down. Thank you all for staying and listening at us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anna. Oh, hold on a second. We gotta use the microphone. It, it, under, I'm you a germaphobe, and I know this, this thing's been held by a lot of people. Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Okay, my name is Anna Thomas. I live at 1616 Liberty Hill in Madison, uh, in the neighborhood in which there's a proposal to have new development. Um, development will happen, we know that. Nashville is the it city now, you know, so that's a good thing for those who want to come, but for those who are existing, that poses a problem when it comes into your neighborhood, into your space. So for that reason, I'm, I'm here to make my point, whether you listen or whether you take it in consideration, but please do. Um, one thing that I would say is that I would 
appreciate for the city and the developments to hear the concerns of the people in the neighborhood. We are an established neighborhood. We have worked hard to maintain where we are and to have someone to come in and to make a proposal that will disrupt what we call our peace. That's disheartening. So for that reason, please take in consideration what we're asking. Um, one thing that I did, I have a concern about is the environmental impact. Um, we are just, you know, going and we're moving ahead to remove environmental areas that have purpose. So I would request that, take that in consideration as someone said, we have animals, that they have a home. How would you feel if somebody just came in and took, you, took your property and moved you out of your home? So in that sense, taking consideration environmental issues that we're dealing with as well. Um, the other concern I have is the additional traffic. We, um, the area that we're in, um, it is a busy street as it is already. Oh, my time is up. Hold on, hold on. I got one other, one other point, okay? Traffic, one traffic is one thing. Sidewalks, we have kids in the area that have to walk, so that's another issue. Um, safety. My main concern that I'm concerned about is the connectivity of our neighborhood on Liberty Hill going into the new subdivision. We have kids that play in that area on that street. We have elderly people who walk the neighborhood. It will not, I feel, will not accommodate through traffic coming through. So I would suggest maybe making a one way in and a one way out as our neighborhood is. And if possible, can our neighborhood be grandfathered in so that our street is not made a connected street? Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate you. Thank you for your time. You all have a wonderful night. All right. And then we'll do rebuttal, then the council lady. Um, sure. I think the only comment I'm going to make is around the density of the proposed project. Um, we, we have devised a plan that proposes 77 units. We're certainly not going to gain more than 77 as development. Um, moves forward, we will more than likely lose units. So I think, I don't know if that helps at all, but that is certainly not a two-way street, it's gonna go one way. Um, and to the uh, extent that I understand some of the, the connectivity issues, um, we're, we're, I, I can make no other promise than we'll work with the neighbors as best we can and try and satisfy all the departments, various departments, public works, everyone else's requirements, fire marshal, as we go. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Council lady, come on up. It's good to see you. Uh, hi. Uh, change is never easy. And um, we've got a situation uh, here. Number one, I'm very, very happy with the folks at Liberty Hill uh, Drive and the people surrounding the area of coming out and talking. Um, one of the great things I think that is gonna happen from this project is a new neighborhood association. So I'm excited about that. Um, I was given uh, a list of names, uh, a petition, uh, kind of an unofficial petition, but official enough for me, um, of the folks that live in the area uh, strongly opposed to the connectivity uh, portion. And I wanted to, to talk about that a little bit because I think that there's always gonna be some concern when there's, um, you know, you, you bought property and you live on a dead end street and you think it's always gonna be a dead end street. Um, and um, the situation is leading us into um, a, a public safety issue for fire. Um, I've asked uh, the applicant to look at whether or not the ingress and egress can all be on Williams itself. Um, but coming in and out on that same street is not really gonna solve the connectivity problem that uh, we know that we, that we have. Um, the sidewalks uh, will be required in this area, but we all know that problem when you have a sidewalk to nowhere, you know, these brand new sidewalks to stop right where all this 
thriving community already exists. So I'll be working very hard um, with Public Works on this being something that we continue those sidewalks on Liberty Hill. Um, and I think that as we see more things happen in this neighborhood um, with the um, uh, very close proximity to Gallatin Pike, um, as well as Old Hickory Boulevard, uh, it makes very good sense to have more sidewalks in this area. Um, you'll see there at Old Hickory Boulevard where Chadwell um, School, I'm mean, sorry, not Chadwell School, um, uh, I'm very tired, um, Madison Middle School uh, and uh, Stratton Elementary are. So it's around a school, it's around a transit corridor. I think, I think we can work with Public Works on getting some more sidewalks in the plan. Um, we all know how long that takes, but I am pledged to make sure that I continue that process and I'm hoping that this new neighborhood association will help me with that. Um, that being said, um, I'm not sure the, the acreage, but I know that in the plans, because this is not an SP, but they did actually show uh, plans uh, to the neighborhood, and um, the portion of both the bioretention and the uh, green space in the middle was how many acres of the nine? It's like two, two so tw almost 20% of the property is reserved as green space. Um, the uh, bioretention um, is very near the um, uh, terminus there currently of Liberty Hill Drive. Um, we've talked to um, the folks, this is gonna be an HOA, but talking to them about um, uh, committing to the fact that the public access to this green space would still be possible. So instead of kids just playing in the woods or at the end of a, of a dead end street, they actually have a park with sidewalks that they can walk to. And with all of that, I think that this is a really good idea. Um, I am very concerned at making sure that the connectivity um, doesn't just serve the new households, but also the ones that are there, and I uh, am confident that this will do that. Um, so uh, with that, I ask for your uh, approval to this um, as we continue the conversation with the neighbors and with the um, applicant uh, to uh, make some guarantees. Uh, because it's not an SP, I can you know, add an amendment to uh, things as we get to the council level to, to show their um, commitment to these changes. And so with that, I have confidence that we can do that in the next phase of this project, and I ask for your approval. Thanks. Thank you, Council Lady. We really appreciate it. And seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Council Lady, you haven't gone first yet, and you know it's your first meeting, and that'd be fun. So on the last one, I'll go first. Yeah. Okay. Um, still remembering things. Does this will this come back before us for like this when it subdivides, or maybe not? Um, it's unlikely that they're, I, they're, I don't think they're planning to subdivide. Um, it wouldn't come back to us for review as the development plan. Okay. It would just go straight to codes. Okay. Okay. Um, I do have, uh, I wanted to back up on the co connectivity and, and the fire tracks because it does look like Liberty Hill is, is, um, Y'all are wanting to not connect, but in reality, if y'all do connect to this new development, they probably will have better fire safety um, looking at the way, what is around here. And I will commend uh, Lucy and the staff because this is like picture perfect of what they gave us at orientation on um, how would you like your neighborhoods to develop and connectivity. And I, I literally think that y'all use this as an example of how you do want, you, you do want your subdivisions that developed a long time ago to to eventually connect so you have better connectivity. So congratulations on, or at least I paid attention, right? I got bonus, <laughs> bonus points for that. Commissioner Elam. No questions. Commissioner Zams. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Councilwoman Van Rees, I wanna thank you. I've said it a million times, and when you guys do your job, it makes ours easy. So no question. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, you said that a B landscape buffer would be um, required along the eastern property line. Can you explain more what that is or how that would look? The 
sorry, getting used to the mic. Um, yeah, so it's based on our landscape buffer standards are based on the subject site zoning as well as the adjacent zoning. So when it bumps up to the existing single family development along the eastern side, um, a, B scape, a B level landscape buffer would be required there. Can you explain what a B level would the, be? There's a range of widths that would make up a B landscape buffer. Um, the the width and the amount of plant materials um, are combined to create kind of a similar type of screening. And so there are places where you could have a 20 foot width with certain landscape materials at certain spacing, um, or it might be a 15 foot width with different landscape materials at different spacings. And so it's gonna be somewhere between 15 and 20 um, with a certain, per a certain number of plantings for each segment. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense and it's helpful. And hopefully um, if the commission approves it, approves this item, that landscape buffer, knowing the existence of that landscape buffer will be helpful for the neighborhood. Um, this is, I understand it's a neighborhood involving policy, but it's also going to be almost twice the units that would otherwise be allowed under the existing zoning. Um, were you, did you have any concerns about the increase in density when you were reviewing this? Uh, we did originally when the application was filed, it was for a much higher intensity. Um, so we worked with the applicant on reducing that to a level that we thought was appropriate, um, which is how we ended up with the RM9A. Thank you, that's helpful. And it's also helpful, the, the language um, that I, I can't remember who said it, but that because this is in the USD, that sidewalks would be required. So that's helpful as well. Um, so I was born and lived to age seven, a stone's throw from here. And if we could have more cases to be heard in Council Lady Van Reese's district, that would be a good thing. And so I'm in full support of this. Vice Chair. I don't think I have any more comments. It's appropriate. You want me to make a motion? You're, you're, you you're, you're like motion? the motion maker. Yeah, all right. Uh, I will make a motion that we um, support staff's recommendation of approval. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And I want to thank everybody for coming down. And thank you, Council Lady. Appreciate it. Now we are on to historic. I think uh, Commissioner Tibbs had to go. Parks, anything? We're having so much fun. <laughs> Commissioner Haynes is having fun. Uh, doing good things for the city, I'm sure. Uh, leases. Yeah, issuing leases. Uh, executive committee, we don't have anything, but uh, we will be having workshops coming up, and we do plan on trying to get the mayor as soon as we can to come and spend some quality time with us. And so, you know, we always try to be on the same page and discuss challenges, which we have a lot of, but I'm very proud of the things that we have done and look forward to working on hard things moving in the future. And so that'll be forthcoming. Director will keep us comprised of that as he as his schedule. You can obviously imagine he's extremely busy in the first part of his duty. So once we get that, we'll, we'll do that. And then there'll be several workshops coming up, I'm sure that uh, we'll work on and um, obviously if you feel like there's a workshop that you want or you need uh, talk to the director and um, uh, we can we can work that out and so if we if we see generally if we see challenges or problems we try to talk about those things and and we'll issue a public workshop for to discuss those particular items um, uh, I do uh, uh, want to take just before the director a little personal privilege, I want to welcome uh, our, a new member of the commission, say congratulations. Uh, we appreciate your service. We know you'll be a valuable member of the Planning Commission. We know that you've been very, very thoughtful uh, over the years as a councilwoman. And so we really appreciate your service to not only the council, but to the commission in that, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, important decisions being made here. So we appreciate that. 
I personally want to say welcome. And director's report, uh, director? I'll be super quick. Um, I want to acknowledge um, item number two, the Wedgwood Houston planning study. Greg Claxton sitting in the back, can you give a wave? Worked really hard on this. I always have kind of mixed feelings, I'll be candid, about not presenting studies like this to the commission. But the fact that we have you know, support and folks are supportive of it is great, but I want to also brag on the work. It was a very creative project. Um, I think Councilman Sledge mentioned that it was um, funded from a grant. And I just want to say two things about it. This is an area of town that has such interesting um, issues associated with makerspace and how you bring kind of an older creative industrial kind of function into an area that's evolving. It's not so different from, you know, like parts off of Centennial and the nation. I mean, I, so I think the idea of Nashville retaining some of that authentic character through its use, function, and appearance was at the center of this. And they tried some creative things. And I don't know if they'll all work, but I like that, <laughs> I like that Greg and the team were we're willing to to experiment, and I think in this department we have to be ex experimental to solve problems. And so they really tried different way of thinking. And so Greg, cheers to you. Let's give it. And thank time. you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to generate opposition next time, so you have to present. Okay, but that's it. Thank you, Director. <laughs> and Council Lady, any legislative update that, that we should be apprised of? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. All right. Well, uh, we have finished our business. Is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, yeah. so motion to adjourn. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.